Hi, I'm Ella McChrystal and this is The New Mind. Now today you'll be able to see that I'm in a slightly different environment because I'm in Spain with Mark Moreau, who I describe as a music legend. He feels quite differently and an artist. Now, Mark, how is it that you describe yourself? I, I describe myself as a, as a silverback gorilla in the music space. Yeah. I can't say legend because that legend sort of implies that I'm legendary, therefore known by the public. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I was always a behind the scenes guy, but I do acknowledge that I had a lot of influence over a lot of careers and pe that people will know. And if you could just name some of those people, because this is where the word legend came in for me, the fact that you've been in that space in that time. Well, people, people, there have been diff distinct phases of my career. The first, first phase, first trimester was uh, as a music publisher. And then my first number one, I was 24 years old, was Pump Up the Volume. And I signed De La Soul um, and I signed uh, Shakespeare's Sister. I signed Massive Attack. Uh, and these were all in the early years of my life, and I was involved with Public Enemy and the Beastie Boys. Um, and then second trimester, I was the president of Island Records um, from 1990 to 2000. And during that period, we signed NWA, we signed Nine Inch Nails, we signed PJ Harvey, Stereo MCs, Pulp, Elbow, Cranberries, Tricky... <laughs> It just, you know, it. I had a fantastic 10 years. This is where the word legend came in for And then me. the last, it's not a trimester because for 20 years, effectively music manager. So when I quit um, organised life and, and stopped being a salary man, I started my own music publishing, uh, sorry, my own um, music management business. And I managed um, the likes of Richard Ashcroft from The Verve, um, Cat Stevens, Yusuf Islam. Paul Oakenfold, international DJ for many years, Lemon Jelly, Spiritualized, um, and then latterly, as the chairman of Crown Talent, managed uh, pop stars like Ella Henderson, uh, Jesse J, Becky Hill, um, and then got into other forms of management. So at one point was was involved in the management of Arsenal captain Robin Van Persie. I personally managed a Formula One driver, Max Chilton, for a while. Um, so I've done a, done a lot. So I don't call myself a legend. I do think that I'm a bit of a silverback gorilla because I've kind of been there, done that. I mean, <clears throat> we, did you mention you two? Oh. <laughs> I mean, just just throw that one in. And and also... So you two I worked with for 18 <laughs> years. Yeah. But, yeah. but I, I didn't thought... sign them. I didn't because you. I think you kind of asked I me what, I, what, yeah. I, what, what my team signed. And, yes. And I want to really emphasise that I can't take credit for... I, I take credit for signing the contracts of all of those yeah. and therefore making the choice. Yes. It was my choice, but it was always my team that brought the brought the, the stuff to me effectively. And I made the decisions about what we pursued and what we didn't. But you too, I worked with for 18 years and I had a really great relationship with. So from Actung Baby to All That You Can't Leave Behind, yeah. all of those records were my responsibility on a worldwide level. So, so, so to me, and I think to a lot of people listening, they'll be like, wow. I mean, De La Soul, when, when, when Carly, because it was, it was the lovely Carly Ashdown that introduced us, and, and I think she, she sent across, you know, a few of the people that you've um, worked with or, or done work for, whatever it is that... And I saw De La Soul, and I was just a bit like... <gasps> I, I, forget the rest of the names, that was on, on its own. Because <laughs> just such icons and game changers. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's interesting that that's one that you focus on, that you care about, mm. but I never got to meet them. Oh. Not until much later. So um, it was, it was a, I had a very difficult relationship, not with them, but with their record label. Right. Because they, they wanted those rights and I got those rights. Got what you. happened is that I, I flew to America on other business and I literally heard um, one of the tracks. I can't even remember which, Say No Go, I think it was, I heard on the radio. And I just thought it was so groundbreaking. Yeah. And I went into my record label. It had nothing to do with De La Soul. And I happened to mention to my friend Rick Dutka, who was the lawyer, who's sadly no longer with us, that I heard this track. I just thought it was awesome. He said, oh, my God, I know um, um, Priority Records that, that own the rights to it. Do you want me to put you in touch with Tommy Silverman? It was, it was um, oh, I can't remember what the, anyway, he put me in touch with the, the owner of the label and I was able to acquire the rights. And it was just one of the, I heard it on the radio in America and, and signed it and brought it back to the UK. 
What's interesting about all of this is here we are, we're in Spain. Whereabouts in Spain are we again? We're in the mountains above Malaga. We're 2,000 feet up in the clouds. And today, normally it's sunny and Ella, you've come all the way out here and it's cloudy and it's drizzling, but we're in the clouds. We are in the clouds. And I mentioned that because that life that you've mentioned, you know, America, UK, you've lived in loads of different places as well, which we'll cover. And you've ended up in the mountains, in the clouds, which is so peaceful and so beautiful yeah. and so different to what one might expect listening to that list of people that you've worked yeah. with and managed and, and published and all this sort of stuff. I have a way of describing it. I yeah. said that I've had a life in the fast lane. Yeah. I don't want to live on the hard shoulder. Yes. I want to live somewhere yeah. that gives me the space and gives me the breathe, gives me the breath and the, even, even just the fresh air here is, yeah. is unbelievable. And what I will do on the, um, on the YouTube and, and hopefully with some of the shorts is just a few photos of those mountains yes. to yeah. show the context of once people have heard your story, to show the context of now and, and yeah. what your life has been. And really, I want to go... Something you said to me earlier makes me want to really cover this. I want to go all the way back to the beginning with you because you said something earlier about really feeling a bit of an imposter, like this happened to you. You can't, you mentioned that you're still friends with some of these greats like Bono and all these people and you feel like it's happened to you rather than you've manifested it, I guess. Yeah. And, and I'm so interested in how this has all happened. Yeah. It's strange. I, I, I do have an imposter um, um. complex. Um, and um, survivor's guilt <laughs> yeah. um, because uh, in reality anything that I have achieved has been as an idiot savant yeah. I'm not trained you can't be trained to spot talent no you just can't no and you also can't be trained to look them in the eye and have meaningful conversations I've had to say no to Bono I've had him pinch me to the point where he bruised my arm when I said that I wasn't going to do something that he wanted me to do. And I was right and he was wrong. And it's hard to say, yeah. you know, truth to power. Yeah. And, and that I've not done through training. I didn't do that at business school or Harvard or whatever. I did it. Um, I just kind of did it. Through um, instinct. Through instinct. Absolutely. Intuition. Intuition. And that's why I describe myself as it, it, an idiot savant. And yeah. The, the, I think anybody that's in the music business that is given access to the ability to sign talent and is given the budget to do so is allowed a one in 10 strike of luck. Yeah. And often the music industry will say one in 10 is who makes it out of all the people that they invest in. But my strike record and my team's strike record, I'm going to say this again, my team's strike record was phenomenal. We had hit after hit after hit, success after success. I haven't, you know, mentioned Apache Indian, uh, Chakadima Simply. I mean, just yeah, all the names, all of these names that we that we achieved over over a ten year period. Semisonic, Blink One Eight Two. You know, we had a fantastic time of it. Um, the New Radicals, um, and um, you, it, it, for me, it all came through instinct. And I, I'm, and and I guess my imposter syndrome is because I don't know what right I had to enjoy that success. I don't understand why. I don't, I don't get it. So this is what makes you so fascinating. I think from even before we spoke, and obviously Carly had told me a certain amount about the work you're doing together, which yeah. we must discuss as well, mm. that, that the art side of everything that you do, is that you're so humble and so down to earth, and yet some of the people you were telling me that you've hung out with and met, and I mean, Bono, the most famous that we've mentioned so far, but there are some crazy names. I don't want to embarrass you, but I mean, you're so humble and so so grounded and so rooted. It, it's a secret weapon in many yeah. respects because, um, I, actually, I'm going to tell you a story about somebody completely unrelated to me, but it's a really good example of the kind of um, ethos that I have. Mm -hmm. um, when the Arctic Monkeys were hot on the scene and they had not signed a record deal, everybody was trying to sign them. Mm. So they were being offered private corporate jet to New York to meet with Lucian Grange, who was the worldwide boss of Universal. They were being offered anything they like 
But the guy who eventually signed them, Lawrence Bell at Domino Records, took them back to his flat, cooked them a curry, and he signed, they signed to him. That's so... Because, because he made an absolute personal commitment. They watched him make a curry for them, you know. That says a lot about them. It totally says a lot about them. Yeah. And it says a lot about him. Yeah. And obviously the success that he had. And it it actually, I, I, I love him to bits, but it reflects my ethos. Um, you know, um, I, I was not into the, court, the private jets and all of that stuff. And I also wasn't into the, the partying. I, I recognized early on, right, right at the beginning, actually, when I started working directly with Chris Blackwell, who was the owner of Island Records at the time, it hadn't it hadn't been sold. So when I, the first eight years I was working directly for Chris, I totally recognised what an utter privilege I had been given, and that I could how I could fuck it up. Excuse my friend. No, don't. Through drugs, through um, drink, through believing my own hype, through all of that stuff, and I. Um, probably didn't have enough fun it throughout all of that 18 year period of working at Ireland I didn't have much fun because I took life so seriously yeah. I just thought I've been given this incredible opportunity and I I think I had that helicopter overview imposter syndrome yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. whatever how you want to mix your metaphors I had that all the way through I I knew how lucky I was to be in that position and and I, and I worked accordingly around it did you think you know you knew I mean it's impossible to say this now on reflection because of the success that you've had but do you think you knew too much you, you know in, in terms of you almost couldn't enjoy it as much of other, as much as other people would because of that seriousness. yes absolutely I, you know I, I saw I saw all of all of you know I, I saw my competitors yeah. partying and with the supermodels and all of that stuff. No, I just got on with with uh, with life and and was quite private. And when it got awkward was um, when when Chris Blackwell sold Island Records to Polygram. Mm. The owners of Polygram recognised that actually I was quite. I, firstly, I was quite serious about my job. Secondly, I was quite articulate. And so they started pushing me out. And so, um, you know, the money program followed me and did a whole week following me about my job and also a, a U2 release that was coming out. Um, a full page in The Independent, a full page in The Guardian, even the, even the front cover of Pravda in Moscow. Wow. You know? So they started pushing me out to do all of this stuff. And then I started getting... That's when the imposter syndrome really kicked in. But yeah. when I started reading my own words back that were sometimes taken out of context um i didn't like myself as much as i ought to um and it was partly because the context in which these articles are written is that everybody wants to glam up they want they want to talk about the glamorous the parties yes. the, 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 and and um and so therefore it looked as it, it almost looked as though i was in that life but i just wasn't in that life i never I never, I never sought to make best friends of my artists. I did become friends with them, but I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, party with them every week. I just did through, through delivering for them. I think what I, with all that being said, and you know, the partying and stuff. I think what we spoke about earlier was that, you know, you're quite introverted. You need maybe to recharge. Mm -hmm. So instead of being able to, a lot of people gain their gold coins through being around people and I think maybe you lose a few so you needed to find that balance of how to be in that world but also how to protect your energy yeah and maybe not because it I mean, who knows what would have happened if you'd have started going partying but also I think your energy is so um kind and like I said rooted it feels do you know the interesting the the independent article which is still available online is um it, the the headline was kind heart big noise. Well, you are, yeah. yeah. You're definitely <laughs> so kind. Yeah. Well, yeah. I try to be. Um, I try. No, I try to be. I I, I don't. Well, I'm. Am I a pleaser? Am I a feeder? <laughs> I suppose I am, really. You well, know. perhaps, but I don't think it's done through any other reason than just that you like to love. I do. And, yeah. And and I need to be needed. It's it's a yeah. it's a strange thing, but I yeah. need I need to be needed. And, and yet you isolate yourself a lot of the time. Yeah, now. I isolate myself. Yeah, I'm quite comfortable in my own company. But then when you do have people, you like to look after them properly. Absolutely. Yeah. 
But there's definitely a kindness and I could see that from the beginning. And then I watched a video on Instagram because you're not really a socials person, no. are you? But you've got this video on Instagram and it was um, you, it's the first, I had not seen you before yeah. really, apart from in photos. And you were talking about you know, how you brought the culture of certain music to the UK with Oh, that was, uh, so Island Records, um, it would have been early last year, was awarded a blue plaque for its yeah. building. And it's it was partly because Bob Marley recorded there. Um, and um, and I I went along and I was expecting the, the managing director to make a speech, but he didn't turn up. So they just shoved me out into, well, in front of, you know, did. I had the mayor of Hammersmith and all of these, all of these dignitaries there and they pushed me out and I, and I made an impromptu speech about effectively it was about Ireland's um, legacy to black music yes. so you know this is not this is not about U2 or Pulp or the Cranberries yeah. this was about Black Uhuru, Sly and Robbie, Apache Indian, Talvin Singh we won the Mercury Music Prize with Bob Marley you know these incredible artists mm. that we even right back to the very first hit My Boy Lollipop, uh, yeah. Minnie Smalls you know um, so I made I made a, a kind of passionate speech about it, but it's because those speeches live in my head. I'm I'm you know I'm I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Island Records, even though I've not worked there for 20, 23 years. Yeah. You know. Well, you I, I was looking at the faces in the crowd actually listening to you talk, and that that's what struck me more than anything. Obviously, it was a beautiful speech, and anyone that wants to see it will put your social media on cool. on the thing so they can have a look. But it was the way people were looking at you. I don't know if you paid attention to no. that when you've looked it back. No. The way people were looking at you, that the energy that you give is magnetic. Yeah. And that's what really drew me in. Because you, you know, see it. The interesting thing, Ella, is that I was phenomenally shy as a mm. youngster. Um, I, was, I started out as a musician. I was a cello player. And so I thought I was going to make a life in music as a rock star. I was going to cure the world's problems with my weeping guitar. <laughs> yeah. it was my feeling and it didn't turn out that way but I but I did help the world yes, in, in other ways um, but I was chronically shy I was so shy I was a cello player that was my first instrument but I couldn't play the cello in the orchestra facing the audience otherwise my knee would shake and I would get this horrible tremolo as my, as my the bow was going across the, the strings um, and so I, I, I got permission to face the back. So I faced the back as a cello player. I couldn't, I couldn't do the public stuff. And um, even, even learning to use the telephone in the old days, before mobile phones or video or anything like that, I would get really nervous if I had to make a call. I was okay receiving a call, but if I had to make a call, I had this palpable sense that whoever I was making the call to wouldn't be interested in me or anything that I had to say. And so I had this real, it's almost like a phobia at the beginning yeah. of my career. And you can imagine how that could have blocked my career. Yes. And when I, when I got the job at Ireland, um, Chris Blackwell, who was, who was the, such a significantly important person in the history of the British, well, the worldwide music industry, yeah. he, he signed and produced Bob Marley, Grace Jones, Robert Palmer, Steve Winwood, all these old acts, Fairport Convention, you know, amazing, amazing man. Um, he f took me under his wing. I was a baby. I was 24 years old. Um, and he saw something in me and he made me managing director of Blue Mountain Music. But at one point he said to me, you're too soft. And yeah. it was a big wake up call. You're too soft. I remember I was waiting for a taxi with him. We just had dinner with Alan Yentob, who was the creative director of the BBC. And I'd pitched two projects to Alan and he said yes to both of them. And, and both of the films got made. Wow. And I pitched and I was only, I didn't know what I couldn't do. I just did what, I, I just didn't know what I couldn't do. I love that. And so, um, so I was waiting for a taxi with Chris and he said, you know, I think, I was probably 26 years old. And he said, I think you can run Island Records one day, but your problem is you're too soft. You've got to toughen up. And that was like a proper wake up call because I really love him and loved him. And he was my creative father. He was mm. more than a mentor. He was like a father. Mm. And the way I toughened up was that I started putting myself in danger. It's going to sound a bit bizarre. It's but... not to me. I love this. Stuff. OK, so I, I started, um, for instance, lecturing at universities about the creative process. I, I went to Harvard and lectured. I, le I lectured at the, L the London School of Economics, Liverpool University, Glasgow University. I, I even um, um, 
Stravinsky, no, Stravinsky University in Finland, you know, no, Sibelius University in Finland. I went all over the world. You've been to so many places. Exactly. <laughs> Le lecturing because then I had to stand up in front of an audience and make a point and be credible. And that actually really, really helped me. Yes. Um, and and it, 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 it forced me into, into sort of behavioral shifts. Um, but my shyness still remained. And I, I kind of, if, if you look at my artists, I specialized in fucked up people. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. Which you, makes you all the more attractive. You, because I'm fucked up. And yeah. so they recognize the, the them in me. Yes. And I recognize the me in them. Yeah. And we spoke a common language. Yeah. And so I could communicate with PJ Harvey. I'm not saying she's fucked up, but she's She she's is flipping phenomenal, she's, though. She's phenomenal, but she's different. I can be friends with Tricky. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I can I can be I can be friends with members of NWA. I'm a posh boy. They're from Compton and Watts. How this, does that happen? This is why because I it's love not you, about it's it's about eye contact and yeah. it's about the human the human condition. You know, it's the experience that you have when you're with someone. It, nothing else matters, and people put the rules in place, don't they? They do. Yeah. And actually, when you sit with someone, it doesn't matter who it is. There's so many things that you can be together on. Yeah. And that's the whole point of this podcast. Really, it was always supposed to be about connecting to people that you would never normally necessarily get to me and if you can't connect to them you'll connect to the stories that they tell about other people mm. and you'll realize that we're all we're really all having the same experience just yeah, in different indeed. it's just geography yeah. isn't it it's just geography so a couple of things here one you mentioned there that you felt like you were a bit fucked up mm. so i would love to know more about that and we'll come back to the to the career because i think that's the the bit that i mean feeling the fear and, and putting yourself in situations which felt dangerous and testing and building that resilience, there was there was a certain amount of self-doubt there, the overthinking of the phone call and, and all of those things. So where does this begin for you? I mean, some of it might be genetic, obviously, but I know that to get the juice, we need to go all the way back. Right. Well, the, I think the backstory is really interesting and it, it really is formative in every, yeah. everything that we talk about. So my father was uh, military. He was a colonel in the British Army, but he's from Mauritius. So he was called up at the end of the Second World War. He spoke no English. His name was Pierre Etienne Moreau. He was bor born in Mauritius. He would have been about 18 years old, something like that. And he was sent because uh, because Mauritius at the time was part of the, Br the British Commonwealth. Mm. Um, not Commonwealth. It was it was one of our uh, uh, territories, um, and he was he went to um, Nairobi and he joined the King's African Rifle Corps, and they gave him thirty minutes to change his name. So he went from being Pierre Etienne to Steve. No, and he stayed Steve throughout <laughs> his entire military career, um, and he spoke no English, and he and he was in a he was in a, in a British uh, the King's African Rifle Corps was a was a was a British uh, corps. And he spent the rest of his life in the army and he fought all over. He was in Egypt. He was, um, you know, for his sins, he was in Palestine. He was Suez Crisis. Um, he, 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 and then the Yemen. And that's where my story starts. Mm. So um, I grew up in the Yemen, which is obviously a hot topic at the moment, yeah. the, the Houthi rebels. And it was a hot topic right there. The, the British Army had, was withdrawing, mm. but they didn't want us to withdraw. They wanted to kick our asses out. Yeah. They wanted to, they wanted to be seen to be kicking our asses out, and so the Houthis didn't exist at the time, but there was their equivalency. So there so there was this thing that was going on, and at the time the British Army allowed wives and children. So we were in a total war zone. I was from the age of four till, well, we had a home there till I was probably about seven. So, so and my youngest brother, Andre, was born there in a war zone. I mean, totally in a war zone. So the sounds, the bangs, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. The so, so, so um, uh, you know, things that just going to sound so bizarre in the context of this conversation, seeing decapitated heads on spikes as I drove to school in the morning of, oh my of, God. of, of um, Arabs who had cooperated with the, with the British army. There might have been a painter and decorator who painted someone's house, but there was his head on a spike. I only saw it once. 
but I was like six years old. You saw it once that you can remember. I can remember, yeah. Which, which we know a lot of it will be implicit anyway. Yeah. And um, it was so horrific. There was a time, there was a time where my, my father um, came back from the officer's mess and he had, it, they call them the blues, but it's the, actually the, the beautiful army red and black uniform, black tie, yeah. medals, yeah. you know. And they'd been hosting um, what, what, the Ark Royal, one of the famous battleships that had come in. So it was the army hosting the navy. And um, somebody threw a hand grenade onto the table. And all the men knew what to do, which was they pushed back and they went backwards because the hand grenade blew up and out like that, like that. And the women who didn't know, the wives, my mother, she was so heavily pregnant with Andre, she couldn't attend. Thank God. Oh my life. But the women stood up and so they all got it. <gasps> so it went and, it, and, and he said that he had, an, he had a naval matron sitting next to him who had her elbow blown off, for instance. <sighs> And I remember my father coming back and shouting up the stairs, Gwen, to my mother, Gwen, Gwen, they blew up the dining table. And my mother coming to the top of the stairs saying, don't be a fucking idiot, Etienne. I'd have heard it because she thought he meant downstairs. <laughs> 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 and, and I remember those things. And I, and I, have, I have distinct memories of the Yemen. I, I, it's really weird. I remember that period at the Yemen so clearly, incidents, the smells every day, everything that I did, because it was so raw and exciting to a young child. Yes. It wasn't scary. It, I wasn't scared. I, I've got no PTSD. I've only got good memories. Because it was normal. It was not only normal, it was just exciting. There's army guns, you know. Yeah. I was a little boy. My yeah. dad used to dress us all up in khaki and we had little shaved heads. And the day that Andre was born, here you go, look at this. The day that Andre was born, my dad pinned medals on our chest this is this is andre's medal this is french foreign legion medal wow and we all so my three brothers all got a medal pinned on our chest because we were we were run like a military family and so i had this excitement there um and but it got too exciting yeah so it was getting so scary that my parents decided and there is a point to all of this sorry <laughs> yeah. but my, no but you keep talking because okay. this is good my stuff. parents decided that they need that they, they had to get my elder brother Christopher and I out because it was just too frightening. There were too many bombs going off. There were too many incidents. Yeah. Um, and so I got sent to boarding school at six years old. And I arrived in Leamington Spa at St. Bede's College. Hang on, hang on. From the Yemen? From the Yemen. To Leamington Spa? Yeah, yeah. You, you, uh, let me, I'll tell you about going home in a minute. So at six years old, I was... And I, Bearing in mind that I was leaving a place that I didn't think was unsafe. A six-year-old brain was thinking Ye yeah. Ye Yemen was really exciting. Yeah. So being dumped in a Roman Catholic, unkind boarding school mm. was devastating to me. And I didn't understand it. And I, I, had, I had a real sense of uh, rejection. Yeah. Uh, There's still a lot of pain there. I mean, these things never go away. We said this outside before we yeah. recorded, didn't we? Um, didn't know why I was there. No, at six as well. And this is before that prefrontal part of your brain is even fusing. So you can't make any analytical sense of this. You can't. And it was an unkind place. Yeah. Tell us more about that when you're ready, obviously. Yeah. Um, and the beautiful thing is when I bought this house in Spain, I drove out with my friend Bill who I met when I was six years old, and oh. we are still friends because we had to make our own family. Yeah, because it was so bad. Very abusive. Yeah. Mm. Well, I was okay. Yeah. I, I wasn't abused. There were people that were abused, yeah. but it was, not, it was not a safe place. Well, no, the energy, even if you haven't had a secondary trauma yeah. because of the energy that's around you. Yeah. Um, but the other beautiful thing is that, um, it's going to sound so bizarre, but every Friday night, there's a Zoom call for all my friends from when I was 10 years old, 11 years old, and we're all in each other's lives still. It's amazing. And, you know, my friend Mike Halloran in America will call me here, knowing that I'm on my own, my friend. But I've got friends all over the world who are from school, because we made our own family, and yeah. it was beautiful. But... The thing about it is, is that 
Firstly, I had to learn to position myself within this pack because it was a it was a it was a wolf pack with no leader. Mm. Um, these were because little boys were a little wolves, you know. And it was um, even though there were priests and there were rules and there was this that and the other, it was a bit. Um, it was a bit like um, uh, what, what's that? That I'm going to fluff this completely. <laughs> that famous book where they where the kids crash on the island and then they oh, all... um, um, Lord of the Lord Flies. Of, Lord of the Flies. It was a bit Lord of the Flies. Yeah, we made our own internal rules as young little boys. And I carved my role as the kind of creative outlier, and I was quite happy with it. I also had this amazing advantage that by the time I was 13, I was over six foot tall. So yes. I was quite, you know, I was quite un unbulliable as yes, it were by the yeah. time. So I, I, I avoided any of the abuse stuff. It's just that it was there and it was a, it was a, real, it was a real thing and, yeah. and, and it needed to be avoided. And so when you talk about it being unkind, was it the, the sort of the system itself of the school that was unkind yeah, or was it yeah. what, the teachers, well, the they, priests? Yeah. So the, firstly, there were no teachers. They were all priests. Priests, yeah. And secondly, all being priests, Catholic priests, none of them had children, obviously. Yeah, of course. And so therefore they didn't know how children worked. They didn't know what children needed. Yeah. And so there was no pastoral care um, of any kind and so I felt that um, and the thing is is that it's the distance from the Yemen to the, so let me let me tell you my journey home so um, and I, I did have a, a bigger brother so I was quite safe because he was eight <laughs> so, <laughs> the big the big eight year old so Christopher um, my beloved brother God rest his soul he's passed away but Christopher and I would be taken by a priest on a minibus to rugby station we get a train from Rugby Station to Victoria or wherever it went in London. And in the old days, the equivalent of British Airways, which was BOAC, I think, um, would check your bags in at Victoria Station and then you'd get a coach to um, Heathrow. Mm -hmm. And and so we were what was called unaccompanied minors. So we had a paedophile's charter on our chest saying, we're, we're, <laughs> we're unaccompanied children. Oh my God. <laughs> Look at us. Anyway, so, but we were always well looked after by the staff. And so we would then fly to Nairobi and then we would have to get across from Nairobi airport to a military base. And we would go on a military transport, sometimes sitting on a box of ammunition or supplies. And we would then have to fly, bearing in mind we're six and eight years old. We'd go rugby to Victoria, Victoria to Heathrow, Heathrow to Nairobi, Nairobi to the Yemen. And that's how we would do it. And it's just, I look at that and I think, how? How did that happen? And my parents were doing it for all the right reasons. Yeah. They were being, they were being kind. They were not, there was no, I didn't, I, not that I understood it at the time, but as a parent now, yeah. I totally get why they had to put us in safety. Yeah. What I don't fully understand is why my mum didn't come back with my baby brother, Andre, and my brother, Guy. I, I felt that probably if I, had been my dad, I would have sent everybody home yes. instead of just the two of us. Yeah. But we were, but also because it was so far away and so difficult to get to, it meant that I really only spent the summer holidays with my parents. Of course. Because I couldn't yeah. go for Easter, I couldn't go for half term, I couldn't go for Christmas. So one or other parent would come back for Christmas and then I was just farmed out. And that went on till I was 18, really, because my parents lived all over the world. I lived in Germany for nine years. We had a little you know, Mauritius, my parents lived in for a while, my father's being Mauritian. Um, and so, and so when I left school and decided that I was going to cure the world with my weeping guitar, <laughs> I didn't need to go to university because, hey, the world was going to unfold for me. Yes. It was all going to be easy. Yeah. And I went to live with my mum and dad back in the UK. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. I was just, I was a different person different person my father just did not get me because I was creative and he was a colonel in the army and I remember hearing him shouting at my mother through the wall that I would never amount to anything I was never going to achieve anything I was wasted he wasted all this money on my education and 
you know, all the stress that he had. And I understand it now as a parent, and I understand money worries and everything else, and I understand the massive commitment that he put into my life mm. and how I seemed to reject it. And when I told him that I was going to join the music industry, See. he wrote to Shoesmiths of Banbury, got the will sent to him, and then held a ceremony at the dining room table with my three brothers and my mum and him, crossed me out of the will and looked me in the eye with a sparkle. He was a very funny man <laughs> and I loved him to bits. And he told me, I'll put you back in when you prove to me that you can make some money out of the music industry. Did, at the time, was that like a right? It was a gonna... total challenge, like Chris yeah. Blackwell saying to me, yeah. you're too soft. Yeah. It was just, it was, it was a fucking driver. Yeah. I had to make money out of it. I had to make a living out of it by hook or by crook because the challenge, I was not prepared to accept his challenge. In fact, I did accept his challenge. I was not prepared to lose. What was more important, proving yourself to him or getting put back on the will? Oh, the, the will was nothing. Was nothing. Yeah. Because money's just not of interest no, to me. No, no, no. So the will was nothing. It was the challenge and proving myself to him. And then there is a denouement. If you want to hear it, do you want to hear yes, the denouement? The yes. denouement is beautiful. So years later, I'm clearly successful and I'm, I am back in the will and have been, you know, I, d I doubt he ever really did cross me off, but that's what the ceremony said that he did. And I, we've had such huge success with the Cranberries. We sold 21 million albums around the world. And I get this bonus check, which is just humongous. I could do with it now, actually, but <laughs> it was humongous. And I was only... 33 years, 35 years, I don't know, whatever. And it's it's a mind-blowing figure that I got this bonus check. And so... Can the, I ask what it would be worth today? Oh, uh, millions of pounds. Millions. millions of I pounds. mean, that's just to give context. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's on top of a great salary. Yeah. You know. Anyway, point is, is that the second album for the Cranberries is No Need to Argue. Mm -hmm. So I got the American multi-platinum disc sent, given to me. And... I sent the check in to Coots Bank, my bankers, and said, cash it and then send it me back crossed. So they sent it me back and I spray mounted it and stuck it on the back of the gold disc, <laughs> platinum disc. And I had a ceremony with my brothers and my mother <laughs> at the dining room table. And I had my dad unwrap, no need to argue. And I said, turn it over, dad. And he was like, oh, wow. God, that is more money than every year in my life of anything that I ever earned added together. And I said, there's no need to argue, Dad. Oh, my goodness. And that was the new more. Oh, my goodness. Did he? Did <laughs> he, he loved ever... it. He absolutely loved it. He kept it, on, on, he kept it on the wall in the loo. And any time any of his mates came around, he'd take it off and, and show them. them. Did he ever apologise for not believing in you? No, no, he didn't need to. He loved me and I knew yeah. he loved me. And so he didn't need to apologise. I didn't want an apology. I just needed to, I needed to win. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> competitive then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I'm very competitive. Yeah, yeah. Which you would have to be. Yeah. But that, that, I'm trying to piece together that creativity with the drivers. Yeah. And also, because some people aren't competitive. I'm not competitive at all. And yet I still have a, a will to succeed. So it's trying to piece these, people listening might go, but. You know, how does someone, because you said there about the imposter and the survivor's guilt, but how does someone do this? And there's really, you can't put it into words, but we can try and get a rough idea of those different components that you have. Yeah, but there's, but there's other, so I've, I've talked about two important um, challenges to me, my dad and then Chris Blackwell. Yeah. But there were two other things that were really, really fundamentally important to me in my life. One was... Um, an unplanned pregnancy when I was 16 years old and the baby was born. Yeah. Not that I've ever met that child and much as I would love to meet that child. All my family know about this. This yes. is something I'm very open about. And it was a total, oh my God, life is serious. There are consequences to the fun you have. Yes. You've got to get serious about life. And that was really important to me. Is that one of the reasons you didn't want to party too hard as well? Is yes. You... Yeah, 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 absolutely. But the second one was was just as important and very, very different, which was that I used to tell everybody that I was a jobbing musician and I did a bit of gardening for a living. But <laughs> the reality is, is that I was a gardener who did a bit of music for oh, a living. That's that. the truth of it. And so for five years, when I when I left school, I worked for Ken Sperry, a beautiful 
natural um, outdoor man. And I, I, I was a gardener for five years. And at one point, I got very ill. I, I had glands in my neck, in my armpits, in my groin. And I was getting very thin and I was having night sweats and something. And I thought it was because I hadn't looked after my teeth. My parents had moved back to Mauritius. I was on my own, living in a squat in Oxford. Wow. And I, I thought I've neglected my teeth. I went to the dentist and the dentist called an ambulance from the dental chair to say, you're very, very ill. And I went, I went to the Haunton Hospital in Banbury and they, pre, they sort of pre-diagnosed. They thought I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And they did all the experimentation and found that it wasn't non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So then they thought it was childhood leukemia. I was 20 years old, I think. Oh, my life. And I was hospitalized. And then they realized that it wasn't the leukemia. And then they eventually diagnosed it, something that people know quite a bit about now. But at the time, it was very, very unknown. And it was toxoplasmosis, which yes. is an amoebic infection. So amoebas get into your lymphatic system. Yes. And they get into your brain. Yes. And they make you very, very sick and it can kill you. And in fact, at one point, it was one of the leading causes of death with HIV in the early days. Right. That's um, where I've heard And that's of it, because people didn't really know about yeah. it. So um, they diagnosed it. And there is a really interesting story. Um, the life cycle of toxoplasmosis is it's cat and mouse. So the mouse gets infected and it changes the brain, the morphology of the brain, and it makes them fearless. And they will approach a cat rather than run from a cat. And the cat catches it, eats it. And there is a cyclical thing about cat shit. And, and you get it from cat poo and cuts. And so I got it as a, in the course of being a gardener. But in human beings, it does the same thing. So God. at twenty years old, and this is this is you can you can read this up. You're this is you're, so you're, exciting. You're clinically you, you yeah. understand. Yeah, there is an amazing study that says that if you had toxoplasmosis, you are one point seven times more likely to be a CEO, an entrepreneur, start your own business, have a startup. It's fucking phenomenal, and it makes me sometimes wonder. Did I did toxoplasmosis sign pulp? <laughs> did toxoplasmosis sign elbow? Did the amoeba sign PJ Harvey? Did, you know this how much of it? Brilliant. It's how much of it was me and how much is did the, because I've said that I was really shy. Yes, and then I wasn't, and I've said that I wasn't shy because <gasps> I put myself in the way of danger. Am I the mouse? You are the mouse. I think I am the you mouse. You called yourself a silverback gorilla. You've got that entirely <laughs> wrong. I'm a silverback mouse. <laughs> it's a six foot three mouse. You need to change all your so <laughs> social media to the silverback silver mouse. Yeah, I love it. That's brilliant. But please do look it up, Ella. Because I will. Because it is real. It really is. It's a, it's a real thing. Toxoplasmosis changes the wiring of your brain and it makes you more entrepreneurial and makes you more fearless. And if you think about my entire career, every single penny I've ever earned has been through being fearless because I make the decision to sign PJ Harvey. It may not, somebody else might have brought it to me, but the buck stops with me. If I had failure after failure after failure, I would have got to three years. Yes. I got to 18 years and then quit of my own accord. And I got to 18 years because we had success after success after success. And so... So there's clearly skill involved in it, but there's a fundamental level of risk taking because you're because every one you're gambling hundreds of thousands of pounds and you only need two bad years and everyone gets bored with you and you're fired. Well, that definitely didn't happen to you. And also, I'm still shocked. I'm so glad on the journey here that we didn't talk too much in the car because I was literally I think my mouth, my jaw was open there for quite some time. And that so this is where. This is where that mixture of something that could have killed you. Well, yeah, to me, you see, I, I was in hospital and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is from somebody at my age. And I was so ill. I'd lost so much weight. And, you know, I can't tell you, my glands were like walnuts in my neck. Um, that, that my GP, who was a very kindly Dr. Boyd, um, came, even my parents were living in Mauritius. Um, my, uh, my girlfriend, Jackie was doing her finals at Brighton university. Um, my brothers were in Mauritius 
and I, uh, Bill came to see me and I made him swear not to contact my parents because I had been told that the prognosis was not good and that I was going to die or potentially could die. Not that I was going to die, yeah. potentially could die because they were trying to persuade me to tell my parents. And I was saying to Bill, it's a crap drop. There's nothing they can do about it. If I'm going to die, I might as well die on my own. And I made that decision. Oh, my life. Because you didn't want to worry then. What's the point? Well. Um, uh, and uh, I, I didn't tell anyone. And eventually, Bill, who was a, such a close family friend, Broke his Hippocratic oath and rang my dad. Thank God for Bill. And he was beautiful. And um, he used to come and visit me in hospital and bring me Guinness and hide it under the uh, hide it under the sheets. Um, and this old Irish guy um, persuaded my parents to come back. And eventually, it was not um, lymphoma. But the point is, is that sixteen pregnancy. Fucking hell, I need to get my life together. 20. Um, potential life crisis. Yes. Um, meant that by the time I got the opportunity at 24, I was ready to take it really seriously. Yeah. I was not going to fuck it up. No. Because life, I had really fundamentally realised that life was not a rehearsal. And I think that, that that's probably the greatest gift you can ever receive. Yeah. To be honest, because we all seem to believe that this we've got a timeline and that we're going to be here for a certain amount of time and actually it can be taken away at any moment and you do have to realize that you've got to make every day count and you've got to say yes to all the opportunities and you've got to really tap into intuition and instinct and feel alive that way yeah because it's such a shame if if you don't get that opportunity and yeah. there'll be lots of people listening that that will feel very lost Yes. And very lacking in that. I always call it the fizz, you know, the bit that makes you want to get up and move and yeah. do things. And I'll admit, you know, I've said this before, I, I struggle with motivation sometimes, but I do it anyway just because I don't want to miss out. Yes. And it feels like that's... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But also there is, there's this dichotomy that you, you, can't, you can't conflate um, shyness with lack of self-confidence. I was self-confident, yeah, but shy. Yeah, it was really well, weird. I I did have real belief in myself and my ability, and that's what carried me through. Yes, it's just that sometimes I wasn't very good at being able to. Ex well, actually, you know what? I was always good at expressing myself, but sometimes I was not very good at putting myself in the in first position. It feels like, because for me, confidence is when you've done something a few times and you know you can do it you feel confident at doing it. Yeah. Whereas self-esteem is that I believe in myself, I like myself. Yeah. And it feels like you had just enough confidence to put yourself out there, as yeah. in, I, I know I can do this, but I just haven't had the lived experience yet. And enough self-belief from the self-esteem. The shyness, I wonder if it was more to do with being more introverted and more yes, it was. needing longer That's to my process. Mother. My dad. Yeah. My dad was a big man. Um, he was a, if I've said it, a Mauritian colonel in the British Army. Very funny, loud, proud. My mother was Welsh lady, oh. but she had four boys and a big husband. Yeah. So she was uh, she was the creative one. So she oh. she and she had wanted to go to art college, but her father wouldn't let her at the end of the Second World War. Um, and she met my dad in, in the early 50s. Um, and so she was the soft one that, that gave me that creativity and encouraged my creativity. Oh, she did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My father, my father um, you know, my father wanted one of us to go into the army. And so eventually my poor, well, not poor brother, he's fantastic, but my brother Guy, who became, he's now one of the world's leading bomb disposal experts because somebody had to go into the army and Guy drew the short straw. He wouldn't say it, describe it like that. He'd, he'd, he'd bomb he'd, disposal experts. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, what a great job. So yeah. he, 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 so I, I've always joked with him that 
that it's the only job in the world where the better at it you get, the more dangerous the project they give <laughs> yes. it. Oh, you're the best in the world. Here's one you'll never be able to solve. <laughs> yeah. But what job titles you've had as, uh, no, you know, as know. a family. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these aren't normal kind of working at Greg's and... Yeah, but my dad was a, a really big character. Um, but I, I, I had a role within my family, though. Everybody has a role, different mm. role. And my role actually was to be the peacekeeper. Yeah. And so I had this, um, my, my elder brother was fierce, feisty, volatile. And, and always my dad and him were like this, you know, um, as, especially as we got into our late teens. And it was kind of my job to calm it down and pour oil on water, which I've carried into my career. Now, when you, you get well, how long did it take for you to feel fully better? I had to change my life. I couldn't be a gardener anymore. I literally couldn't pick up a spade. I was so ill. I couldn't, I couldn't carry my guitar. I, I was so ill. I was so weakened. And it took two years for a, a recovery. And so Jackie, my, my first wife, um, had just graduated as a graphic designer and she got a job in London. So the two of us moved together. And I got a job working behind the counter in R. Price Records in Hounslow. Oh, wow. R. Price Records at the time, you, to any of your listeners yeah. who don't know them, it was a really big chain yeah, across the country. And we were in, so you've heard of the, the mega stores. Yeah. We were in the mega store. We were, I was in the smallest <laughs> one that they had in Hounslow. So we used to call it the mega store. And, um, and I, um, so I, I worked behind the counter and, and I had every Wednesday off because I had to work weekends, Saturdays. And every Wednesday I had off. And um, my brother Andre had a girlfriend who was um, working as a receptionist for a tiny little music publishing company called Eaton Music. And she heard that there was an opening coming up. So Andre and Jackie and somebody else, I can't remember, the three of them drove me to, e I had no appointment, drove me to Eaton Square marched me up the steps, banged on the door and ran and left me there. And the door opened and I said, I heard you've got a job going. Oh and so I got an interview with Terry Oates, who was a fierce man, a fantastic ex-trumpet player who used to play trumpet for the Kratos. Oh, wow. And Terry interviewed me and we got on. We, we got on really well. And so I started working there every Wednesday for nothing. So for a year... I interned and so I would turn up every Wednesday and I would just do my thing. And after a year... What was your thing? Sorry. I had to do anything. So it could be royalty accounting. It could be uh, uh, take a status quo record and plug it at Radio 1. It could be anything. It, I, I was working with Dame Edna Everidge at the time. And so it would be carrying the, the, the music score Dame to the Edna orchestra. Edna I mean, this just gets more random. Oh, totally random. I work with status quo. who was so, and I love them to bits, yeah. even though they're so unme musically. Yeah. But I'm still friends with them. You know, after all these years from See, when I was legendary. when I was in my 22 years old. Anyway, point the point is that um, that Terry, after a year, said, "Mark, we we really respect what you're doing for us. We 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 can see your commitment to it. Here's a job." And so I got five thousand pounds, and I've still got the letter. Of five oh, thousand so pounds lovely. a year, delighted to offer you five thousand pounds a year, and so that's what I was earning, um, and that was the beginning of my career. And then uh, I won't bore everybody with the details of it, but there was a project where we were music publishers, and we looked after some amazing people. We looked after, um, the, you know, the uh, film composers. So we had George Fenton, um, we had Carl Davis, um, we had. Um, um, Oh, what's his name? The, the guy who wrote the music for um, Pink Panther. You know, mm. the really famous yeah. um, um, uh, film composers. That yeah. was the speciality of the company. And I worked on a project where Island Records owned the record rights and we owned the music publishing rights. And I did a good job. I know I did a good job. I did something that got the attention of Island Records. And that's how I got headhunted to join Island Records. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So it starts with basically a bit of cherry door knocking. Absolutely. <laughs> and they you just, you know, they, they knocked on the door and just left me to it. <laughs> Wait, that's just great. And there you are, like, oh, hello. And a shy, and a shy yes. guy who never would have made the phone call to say, can I have an interview? Well, and they God. knew it, which is why they did it. So I, I, I 
I will give a little bit of credit to my brother Andre, <laughs> just a little bit, and my ex. Well, it's so good that they saw that in, I mean, because that's what you need. This is, you've said the word team a few times, and it does take the whole village to make the success, totally. doesn't it? Totally. And I, I'm so aware of that at Island Records, because the other thing too is that when I got the job, you moved from music publishing. Music publishing is all about the ownership of the song rights and the yeah. exploitation of the song rights. Yeah. You don't sell anything. That's what right. record companies yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at 29 years old, I get promoted and given the job of running Island Records. At and 29? I've 29. And I've never sold anything in my life. I've never had to confront the public. Here's a product. Do you want to buy it? I'll sell it to you. Never had to. So... I recognized the weakness in myself there and I recognized my own shyness and all of those things. And I, so it's like a, a self-awareness thing. I've, I've always felt quite self-aware. Yeah. And so I surrounded myself with people that were stronger than me and better than me mm -hmm. in those areas. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, but all the same age. So I, I put this really young team around me of people that were complementary to me um, and in most cases, better in their discipline than I was. Um, and in some cases, I had a head of talent, Nick Angel, who I was very, very close to, who um, who w was also a, a stronger personality than me. I, I wanted people that, that, that were complementary, and so yeah. team was really important to me. So you must have a very balanced ego to be able to do that, to see that, because... You realise that it's not about you, it's about that. that no, very you can holistic... look at it that way. That's a nice way of looking at it. There's another way of looking at it, which is it's self preservation. Yeah. On my own, I'm not a team. I wouldn't mm. be able to achieve it. Mm. With a collective of people that are like minded, have mm. a common vision, mm. and are strong and good at their jobs, I'm better. Yeah. I'm better. But I'm better protected. That that's that's logical and it's in it's it's right, I think, everything you said about self preservation, but people with egos can't do that. Yeah. They they can't see that they're not the most important person in the room. Yeah. Whereas you have that ability to again, that's instinct and intuition and you know, I think also testament to the humble beginnings as well. Just I mean, you've got this plethora of experience by the time you're twenty. Yeah. Which is unlike most people's experience so you've you've your brain is probably good at picking up on what will work and what won't work far quicker yes because you've got that kind of um multifaceted resilience you know we we talked about the decapitated heads and then going to a very unkind school really young and being away so far away from mum and dad and then having those teenage experiences and you know this disease and there's so much there before you've even before done I've life. Started. <laughs> so it does make you quite different. All right. I don't see that. No. But I, but I, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. it does. Because you often hear about trauma. And of course, everyone's got lots of different experiences. But they're all kind of massive experiences. Yeah. They're not small. I mean, I don't like to, I don't like to say big traumas and little traumas because it's perception and yeah. the manifestation in the person. But for you, that let's face it they're not small events they're both th those were two big traumas they yes. were life-changing traumas yes well even even though you don't perceive it to be a trauma some people would perceive seeing a decapitated head as no a i don't you see i it's just the strangest thing that there is a blank space in my childhood which is post yemen yeah because the yemen was so powerful yes. so strong so yeah. so exciting we used to go um we used to go to school um, in, a, in a bus with a with a, a a jeep with a giant machine gun on the front with a with a soldier holding a machine gun another one pointing backwards behind and that's how we went to school every day every day every day there were, before we could go out at 11 o'clock for our for our break the, the an army patrol would patrol the playground and they would pick up the dead carcasses of cats and dogs that the yemenites had thrown over the side but it was all because it was all hearts and minds they they knew that the children were vulnerable. So they would run over cats and dogs, throw them into the compound. Every day, the army patrol would have to scrape them up and throw them back over the barbed wire and also check for bombs because the bombs would come in in brightly covered, colored um, pencil cases. So they'd be plastic, pencil case, unzip it, blow your hands off. 
they used to float them around. We used to be delivered to Tarshan Beach, which was a beach with a natural alcove, machine gun nests all around the top, and a shark net to keep the hammerhead sharks out. But what they would do is when they knew the tide was right, they would float the pencil cases so they would come round into the beach. And this is a fact. One day, my father was asleep on the beach. My mum was reading a book. And my brother Christopher walked up the beach holding a brightly coloured pencil case. And there was a guy sleep on, on, the, on the beach next to us who we didn't know, who recognised exactly what Christopher had. And he screamed and ran at him, picked up the pencil case, threw it into the car park where it blew up a car. That's a fact. Oh, That's, my This is the God. life. I'm six years old. I'm thinking, this is fantastic. <laughs> I don't think of it as being traumatic. It's the strangest thing. I, I, I look at back at that bit of life and I think I, 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 can, I can taste the vinegary tomato sauce and I can feel the sand on because of the sausage, egg and chips I've had on the beach and the sand has blown onto my... And the tomato sauce was not Heinz. It was really vinegary. Yeah. I've got it. I, I can taste it. I can feel the grit of the sand in my teeth. See, how does that play out for you? Because obviously your life has been quite exciting in, in many ways. I mean, most people would think that some of the, the experiences you've had are exciting. And yet here we are in, in it, you, well, you, you told, told me a story earlier about opening your windows and the clouds come into your bedroom. So we're literally in the clouds and a lot of the time you're on your own. How do we go from that little boy who's got all of this excitement to the sheer peace I, I think I describe it that I've lived life in in the fast lane. Yeah. And I don't want to live on the hard shoulder yeah. anymore. Yeah. I, I need the peace. And I fucked up a marriage. Yeah. I, I, and I loved my wife very much, but I fucked it up. My fault. Mia culpa. And I am recuperating. Yeah. I'm in recovery. Yes. And so this is, well, this is a brilliant place to recover. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're here at night on your own and you're kind of thinking about your life and you know the mistakes that you may have made or the perceived mistakes that you've made and the the wonderful accolades and all of that I mean what goes on in the head of someone that's got all of that experience when you're on your own looking over the mountains I don't really dwell on it um I don't and it's interesting so I've come to a new place with new people and I'm making great friends here and they're being the community here is being very welcome. Do they know what you've done? And they're beginning to know what I've done. I think people are beginning to know that I'm a bit odd. <laughs> I, am, <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't village, describe you as odd. I'm the village eccentric. And I think people are intrigued. And they, you know, people are beginning to, for instance, okay, follow him on social media. And suddenly I'm talking about my life with PJ Harvey or my life with Bono. And then, oh my God, there's his, he's got a new exhibition opening in Liverpool. Yes. In, in the National Slavery Museum. Yes. Or, 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 or um, the, the Army Museum in Chelsea, you know. or a Mercury Prize Award, or just Mercury, saying, you? you know, you know. So people are people are beginning to, I think, realise that I'm I'm an outlier. That's yeah. that's how I describe it. But yeah. I I like being that. I'm I'm quite happy. I'm I am a bit eccentric, and I'm quite happy to be. Yeah. Um, but I don't. It's weird. I'm I'm not on my own. I'm so surrounded on a worldwide basis with yeah. friends. You know. Yeah. On Christmas Day. On Christmas Day, I'm communicating with friends all over the world. Mm. Uh, you know, Mauritius to Australia, to Hong Kong, to San Diego, to the UK, to Spain, all over the world. I've I have these conversations and you really going feel on. It. And also, people are being, I think, very thoughtful about me. So I'm I I I. There's not a day where I'm I don't talk to people. Yes. Because I'm on Zoom. Yeah. I did a nearly three hour Zoom call last night. Yeah. You know, to the point where I was exhausted at the end of it. Well, actually, it probably is more exhausting doing it on Zoom because yeah. you have to concentrate a bit more. The energy is not in the room. Yeah. Although I know it's a very, I do a lot of online sessions as a psychotherapist. And so I know that there's a lot of benefit, but there's something about being in the room with somebody there as is, well. There is, but I also, um, I'm pretty good at making sure that at least once a week <laughs> socialise. Yeah. And then people come here quite a bit yes. too and they're very welcome. Yes. Well, you're all very welcoming. Yeah. which is why I think people like to be here, because it's not just the scenery, it's you as well. And you must have a million stories. But actually, you mentioned the exhibitions there, so I just want to sort of touch on that, because we haven't touched on that yet. Yeah. Um, 
you've always been creative. Yes. And is it fair to say that you kind of had to choose which way you would go? Yeah, I studied, I started studying art. So even though guitar was what I really wanted, I needed to do something. So I, I did a foundation course in, in, um, in arts, which meant that I touched everything from pottery to photography to painting to drawing, everything. Um, and whilst I was there, so I, I, I really loved it and had to make a decision. And whilst I was there, I met a musician joined a band and the decision was made for me. Yeah. So that's, you know, it's a typical prototypical story that goes from Brian Eno to, to David Bowie to, yeah. you know, people that start out in art and then move on into, into music. And it's all around us everywhere. And, yeah. and what's really special about this, and you've shown me earlier, although these paintings are beautiful on their own, they are stunning. No one can see them, but we'll take some photos and, and put them on. Um, you do something really special with them. And you're working with Carly Ashdown, hence I mentioned yes. her earlier because she connected us. Yeah. And you've worked with, um, well, I'll let you tell the story because you'll tell it much better than I. Okay. Tell me what you do now. All right, so art has always been really important to me. And so if you also think about the fact that I ran the major record label for 10 years, you then got to think that we released 50 singles a year, okay? For each of those singles, we make a video. Yeah. For each of those videos, we would have five, six scripts. Yeah. So I would read every script. So every year I was reading 500, 600 scripts, trying to understand what works in a three minute period for an audience. And so I got to really understand, uh, you know, a sort of visual literacy. Um, and I also had an overall, even though there were other people that executed, I had an overall um, interest in all the artwork, the album sleeve designs, the photography, the videos, anything that an artist had, I had a, a, an overview on. And so I, I kind of kept up my, my props uh, in, 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 uh, in artistry. When I became an artist manager, you too bought me a beautiful camera. I was at a gig in Johannesburg. And I said, oh, one of my big regrets is that I didn't keep up with my photography. And then suddenly they gave me my first ever digital camera. And this would have been 1990. So it was probably one megapixel. Like <laughs> yeah. But then they gave me a pass, free pass forever to, to be at the front to take photos. Oh, wow. And then I started getting really serious. I became friendly with Anton Corbin, who was U2's photographer. And I started taking proper photos. I bought a Pentax 67.2 medium format camera. I bought a Hasselblad. I started getting really into it. And then suddenly my work was being used, even though I never charged anyone anything. I, I'm, I'm, I made it onto Richard Ashcroft album covers, Cat Stevens album covers, um, even Billy Ocean, who chose me to become his photographer. I didn't manage him. I didn't. He just saw my pictures and asked me whether I would take his photos. Wow, wow. So I became a, a, a photographer, even though I wasn't charging anyone, it was it was my hobby. I, I did a, a Aswad album cover. I did all sorts, you know. Wow. So that was so I kept up the creative thing is what I'm saying is that I never let go of that. Even though I had a day job, these these were sort of um, beloved hobbies, really mm. hobby. And what happened was that we had a purple patch. I was chairman of Crown Talent. We managed Jesse J, Ella Henderson, Becky Hill. Um, Jesse J had a number one single with with Bang, was it Bang Bang? Yes. With Ariana yeah. Grande yeah. and Nicki Minaj and Jesse, And that got knocked off by Ella Henderson with Ghost. <laughs> and so we had two number ones in a row. That got knocked off by <laughs> Becky Hill with Gecko. We had three number one singles in a row. And when, you can imagine what happens when, you, when that happens. Firstly, people think that you're a genius. Secondly, She's they there. think that you have, a perp, you, have a, you have a magic touch, which is, you know, it was coincidental. Three I'm... different record companies, three different women. And, they, and it was their brilliance that made it happen, not ours. You know, we just steered it, as it were. Um, and, but brands come running. So, for instance, you'd imagine clothing brands, hair and makeup brands all came running. And then in the middle of it all, everything used to get deferred to me, um, was this weird technology company doing augmented reality mm -hmm. called Blipper. And so Steve from Blipper turned up and... He wanted me to persuade the record companies to have the artists make the album sleeves come alive. I couldn't get anyone interested. The artists weren't interested. The record companies weren't interested. But I saw the demo and I thought, fuck, that is a game changer. Yeah. Augmented reality. And they showed it to me. It's going to sound bizarre, but it was on a Heinz tomato ketchup bottle where they 
held their device, the phone, pointed it at the, at the Heinz tomato ketchup bottle, and a and a really neat um, um, recipe book opened up. Wow! And then you could flip the pages, pretend, oh. and it was just brilliant. And yeah. I thought, you know what? There was this girl, Scarlet Raven, a painter who'd been pestering me for a year and a half to manage her. She kept saying, you manage football, guys. You manage Formula <laughs> One. You manage pop stars. Why can't you manage a painter? And I kept saying, I don't know anyone in art. And I said to her, if, if I come up with a big idea, I'll come back to you. Oh, my God, the big idea came to me. So I saw augmented reality and I approached Scarlett and I said, can we have a crack at this? And she was said, oh, yeah, absolutely. So we started doing... We used to think we were Gilbert and George, you know, serious artists. But in <laughs> fact, we were Wallace and Gromit. That's the reality. So we started, right. we started doing um, stop motion animation. So I suspended a camera from the ceiling and a canvas on the floor. And every time she put paint on the thing, she, and she'd have to lean back and press a button. Carly, Carly was telling me about yeah. this. Yeah. It's really labor intensive. Yeah. Um, and we made a collection of paintings um, that... Um, uh, and I, I, we shared them with um, two guys in the music industry, um, Ian Weatherby Blythe and um, Glyn Washington, a very senior. Ian is the managing director of Castle Fine Art, which has 42 galleries, yes. in, 40 galleries in the country. Um, and Glyn Washington is um, Washington, Washington Green, Green. Yeah. which is one of the biggest um, fine art publishers in the world, actually. And they signed us up immediately, which was just... And I didn't know who they were. I'd been introduced to them by another artist. I didn't know how important they were. But effectively, it was like signing to Island Records. Yeah. So we signed um, a publishing deal and a, and a, a label deal, as it were. And we, Washington Green came to you? Uh, no, I, w I went to them. You went I, to I, them. I, I, I was introduced by one of their artists. And, and I think Glyn was like, OK, I'll, let's hear what he has to say. <laughs> but he, he, took it, he took it immediately. Anyway, we... we um, they all got so excited about it that I thought I can't do this because it's all World War One. It was all very. I commissioned. I had work from um, poetry, so I, I was using people like um, Rupert Brooke and Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon, all oh, the most amazing. powerful um, Alan Seeger, the most powerful World War One poets. But I had Christopher Eccleston, Sean Bean, Stephen oh, Graham. I'm so jealous. I had. Um, um, Gemma Arterton, Vicky McClure, all perform these incredibly powerful poems, which I then incorporated into the painting. So I merged it all into this augmented reality. And so I had some of the most powerful poetry ever written, yeah. in, written in distress, yes. by, uh, performed by some of the most powerful actors that yes. Britain could offer. Yes, And then Scarlett and I animated it in what was quite a rudimentary way because we're not neither of us are trained animators um i i started animating because i was trying to show scarlet what she should do she just couldn't get her head around it no and so we had our first exhibition i borrowed a space from my friend chris duffy who was a director of a um of a, of a large property company in the uk galliard and galliard very kindly lent me a restaurant for for a month and we put 10 paintings and we had a thousand, no, 1,100 prints. And in one month, we sold every single thing. So the first painting, the first two paintings sold for seven and a half thousand pounds. The last one sold for 37 and a half thousand oh my pounds. Oh gosh. And then every single print went and they were, they ranged from, the prints ranged from 250 pounds to 2,000 pounds. And so we probably, we grossed, you know, approaching a million pounds in one month. The first thing I've ever done in art, never done it before. Oh, that was easy. And then the um, somebody um, shared it with the head of culture in Liverpool, who then invited me to go to the National Slavery Museum. So then suddenly um, we're having to create, because we've sold everything, so we have to start again. No. So they've all gone. So we start again, and we do have to do another exhibition in a really short period of time. And this is what took me out of the music industry because I could no longer do yeah. my day job. But I saw this incredible opportunity. But the thing, I don't want anyone to think that selling everything and making a lot of money, by the way, that doesn't come to the artist. We make like yeah, 10%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so don't, don't think I got rich doing it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, point is, is that I saw it as an amazing opportunity to do something for myself for the mm. first time. And I really loved working with Scarlett. 
Um, and she let me do her th my thing and I let her do her thing and we worked really well. Um, and so suddenly we're on this, we're, 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 it's unstoppable. So from Liverpool, um, the mayor of Manchester sees it and invites me to go from the National Slavery Museum in Liverpool to, Man to Manchester Central Library. And from Liverpool, um, the curators of the Titanic Museum in Belfast see it. And we be, we're, we're off for three months there. Then the National Army Museum in Chelsea. And then we go to Stockton on Tees and we go to Malden and we go all over the place. We had eventually we had 11 exhibitions um, and we sold millions of pounds worth, well, Castle in Washington, <laughs> sold <laughs> yeah. millions of pounds yeah. worth of work. And we just about made a living out of it. But it was it was an amazing experience. But the thing is, is when you came to the exhibition, you may have come with a group of three, but you're disintermediated. You're given an iPad and headphones. You point the iPad at the paintings, and then suddenly you've got angry Sean Bean yeah. delivering a really fierce poem. Or you've got Sophie Ocanado, the, the beautiful yes. black actress, yes. Yes. Do, doing a wistful, beautiful version of Rupert Brooke. Um, some corner of a foreign field, emotional, really emotional. And the, the um, I can show you here. I've got I've got all the books up here. I used to put visitors' books, and we've we've got I I I have to say we've got thousands of entries saying it made me cry, mm. it made me cry, and that's mm. what the exhibition was able to do because mm. it, it art is is as a really interesting one. I was talking to the mayor of of Liverpool, Steve Rotherham. He's mm. the Metro mayor. He came to the exhibition and a woman came out of the end. We were in the concession area where the prints were for sale. And I was just chatting about it. And a woman came out of the exhibition in bits with her husband. And um, she was crying her eyes out. And I, I said, Steve, sorry. And I said, I'm really sorry. And she said, why are you sorry? And I said, because I'm half the artist. And she put her arms around me and she, she, my lovely... She, Hugo Boss t-shirt got <laughs> snot all over it as she kept saying art's not supposed to do that art's not supposed oh, to do that I art's disagree. not supposed to do that and the husband was patting me on the back going sorry mate sorry mate sorry <laughs> and I've got the mayor the metro mayor of Liverpool in front of me but art art should do that yeah. but it doesn't you'd have to be you'd have to be a bit fucked up to stand in front of the brilliant Edvard Munch's The Scream yeah. and actually cry. Yes. To actually cry. Yeah. But here, really, it, it, what I'm doing is a bit of a little con job because <laughs> if you're watching a Netflix series, we're all used to getting to that bit that chokes you. Yeah. And you go, oh, my God. And it's like three-minute sequence. Yeah. The music swells. The words are good. She's dying. There's nothing he can do about it. You cry. Yeah. I do that. That's why I refer back to reading 500 scripts a year. Yeah. Learning what happens in three, what can be done in three minutes, and then condensing all of those three minutes into every piece of work that I did there. So each time people watched one, they're being sucker punched in a way. They're being hit by that three minute piece in the Netflix series that makes you choke. You've got powerful words, powerful performance. Bespoke music. I had a fantastic, have a fantastic friend, Mark Cannon, who's a film composer who composed all the music. So the music is specially written around the music and it swells at the right place and it emotes at the right place. And he's a formidable, very successful film composer and understands the psychology of the listener yeah. and the words. He has to understand the words to know how to make it, make it emote. And so in a way you could look at it and say, oh, it's a con job, as I say you know, you, you're, you're just condensing. But it, it was not. It was all inspired by, by my grandfather by marriage, from my first marriage, um, Eddie Bigwood, who was born in 1898 and died in 1998. And he was my special friend. I absolutely loved him. And partly because he knew I came from a military family, I was one of the few people that he really opened up to about his First World War experiences. Mm. And eventually... What a privilege, by the way. And it was a, an amazing privilege. Um, and eventually, we, he was in, recorded by the Imperial War Museum, and so I was able to use some of his words in wow. recordings. But he um, was in the Bristol Pals Brigade, which were terrible things, where all the, all the friends from the same class, the same school, the same church, the same factory, all went to war together and fought together. Wow. So if there was a cataclysmic battle, everybody died. 
oh that went God. to the same school, that went to the same church, that worked in the same factory. It was a terrible, terrible decision that never has been repeated. Yeah. Cal's Brigades was a terrible idea. And Eddie, um, Eddie at um, 16 years old, was um, lied about his age. At 17 years old, he was in the Battle of the Somme and he and he a, a, a shell blew up and a piece of shrapnel took a lot of his bottom jaw back, back teeth and his right ear oh my God. and they sent him back to england stitched him up let him recuperate for four months and sent him back no and he survived the whole of the first world war and he was profoundly deaf because the concussion had destroyed his left ear yeah and the and the sh and the piece of brass had destroyed his right ear so he was profoundly deaf and they had to be nudged to go over the top when the whistle blew because he couldn't hear the whistle. He was so deaf uh. before, before hearing aids, you know. Um, and he was just this fierce little fella, loved him to bits. He's about five foot two um, and he was um, an astonishing guy. And he, it was him and his stories that gave me the inspiration to do all And also... All of these poppy paintings, yes. these flower paintings, yeah. that was Scarlett's work. And what I did was see Scarlett's work, know what I knew. And also, you've got to bear in mind, if you, this is not cynical, but it was the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War was coming up yeah. in, th in three or four years' time. Yes. So it, it, that's how it all came together. Wow. I mean, again, just even the conversations that you've had with people, you know, whether they're music or or military or painters or any sort of creatives. It gives you such a, a vast insight into the human experience, doesn't it? I would hope so. It really does. <laughs> I'm I mean, not sure if um, everybody that knows me would say I've got much insight, but I think I, I think I've got you some have. insight. I, I think, think you have. I, I would say, I think, um, I know if you don't mind me saying, when you'd listen to Carlos, you're like, oh, I feel a bit nervous now because she's so interesting and it, but I think this has been really interesting so far. I mean, there's so many different stories coming out of one person. <laughs> I mean, how can you not see yourself as interesting? I'm still on the journey. That's the thing. Yeah. I'm, I am. I'm supposed to be at that, uh, getting to that age where retirement is on on the cards. I'm 65 this year. I don't mind people. But you now. don't look either. You think I'm at look 75? <laughs> <laughs> you look younger, yeah, not okay, older. <laughs> And and I and I'm not I'm not in it, I'm not I haven't finished on this journey no. because, because I have never had a job. If I I, I, I have yeah. I had a salary, I've had a pen. You know, I've only ever done my hobbies. I mean, I mean, isn't that amazing? And that is amazing. I've only ever done my hobby. So, so, so I would say that many actors could say that. I would say yeah. that Ronnie Wood can say that. And yeah. Big Jagger can say, I've only ever done my hobby. But there's not very many people that are effectively executives that can say that. No, and, and this is the thing about you, and I've read this about you when I was preparing, and I think I've, I've either read it or seen videos on YouTube or whatever, um, that, that you were a different type of executive because you were also an artist and you understood yeah. that much more than I think any other executive would. And so I, that's how you made friends. I, I, I think so. I, I think that I have, um, I, I think that even though I was in this lofty position, managing director of Island Records, I'd merged by this stage at one point, Island Records, MCA Records, I Universal know. Records, Motown Records. I'd merged, merged it into this all. vast company, which it is now. Yeah. Really, really powerful company. I did all of that. But still, when I sat with people, I think they could see an artist. I think I could cut through the clutter. I could demystify the big, powerful executive. And I could be, um, um, I could have an artistic conversation with, yeah. with, with Polly Harvey or with Tricky or Jarvis Cocker. Yeah. Guy Garvey, you know. Yeah. So... Tell me about some of the most interesting conversations you've had to have, if you can. I mean, not with, I don't want you to break confidence, but, you know, the difficult times within that. You mentioned the saying no. The, yeah, the I had to, yeah that. there's, uh, there's actually one, there's one, there's two battles that I won with, with Bono, <laughs> which are worth talking about because, because he was so ginormously huge as a talent. He's a year, he's a year and two days younger than me. Right. Um, and my 
my beginnings with him, I started working with you two, I suppose it would have been 1982. It was around about, it was um, Under a Blood Red Sky, mm -hmm. which was the live album that came out. And so my first big responsibility was um, The Unforgettable Fire. And I had loved them up until this stage outside when I was working at Eaton Music and working at Our Price Records. They were one of my go-to mm -hmm. bands. So I had a real affection for them. And so one of the first things I did was um, I, I couldn't persuade our sheet music publisher to do a, a printed book of their music. Mm -hmm. So I did it myself. And so I got my guitar out and I learned the guitar patterns and I had the lyrics. And then I got Bono to handwrite the lyrics so I could then photograph them. And I, I did a deal with Anton Corbin, the, the U2's photographer, and I produced a book called Portfolio. And I had it printed in Korea and, oh, you know, because I couldn't get the, my print publisher. They, they just didn't know who U2 were. They didn't give a shit. I just knew they were going to be huge. And so I did this. I made this book called Portfolio, which I'm credited as an author of, which is not true, as a producer of. And it sold hundreds of thousands of copies. But the interesting thing was that my first real impact with U2 is that I needed to get the music approved. They needed to, I need, so what I had done myself needed to be correct. So I went on the road with them and I went on the back of a bus in Germany with them. And I was with them for about two weeks whilst they mercilessly took the piss out of me because I was so wrong, my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have Edge and Bono doing my version <laughs> This is insane. Oh, by the songs way. at the back of the coach, whilst I squirmed in humiliation with thirty people all laughing their head off at me, and this was how I first they came. And then I, because I didn't, I didn't get offended. No, I got what I wanted. I got the fucking book. Edge yes. wrote out the guitar parts. Bono wrote out the lyrics. I got the book. And you know what? I lost all of that stuff. That people were fortune. Man. You lost all it. All the handwritten stuff I've got. This is in a storage lockup somewhere. Oh my not, not goodness! Good anyway, point being is that I started this great relationship with you two that has, that lasted for many many years. But there were always there were difficult times too. So um, first one is and oh, I hope he doesn't listen to this. But <laughs> He, he, I hope he bloody well does. Okay. So, of course you do. So Bono wrote the script to a film called Million Dollar Hotel. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had a big Hollywood film actor produce it. And it, had, um, it, it was produced and it was made. And I got called over to Dublin to talk about the um, plans for the soundtrack album. And I sat in a Dublin editing suite, um, fil booth, a film student thing. Just me and Bono, and I watched the film, and I sweated through the film because it was shit. <laughs> to put terrible. it bluntly. It's terrible. Well, I mean, nothing but a truth teller. It's <laughs> terrible. So we get to the end of the film, and Bono is expecting me to say, okay, we're going to take this to Radio 1, and it's going to get its you know, big plans and MTV. And, <coughs> and I say, Bono, it's not great. And if I release a U2 single, it can only draw attention to it. And if I draw attention to it, it can only embarrass you even more. Oh, my goodness. You had to say that. I had to say that to it. And I, I know I'd been set up to do it by Paul McGuinness, the manager, who I, who I knew, well, I didn't know, later subsequently knew, felt the same thing. Right. But he wanted a truth teller in yeah. the room. Yeah. And he was too close to it. This is um, the shy boy, by the way. This is the shy boy who, who doesn't take risks, but also is fundamentally aware of his responsibility. My responsibility to Bono was to guide him away from a big pit that he was yeah. going to step into. Yeah. Anyway, he grabbed me by the arm, pinched me on my arm really hard, looked me directly in the eye. He was having to look up because I'm tall. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Bono. Sorry, Bono. Sorry, <laughs> And he pinched me so much so that it bruised me. And he went, you're right. He knew. And that was the end of it. So we released the soundtrack album. We never released a single from it. We didn't take anything to radio. Didn't draw any attention to it. We did the minimum that we could do. How did he know so quick? He because must have, he, he knew. knew. He was, he's not stupid. He watched the film. Would that relationship have been different between you two if you'd have gone ahead with it? Yeah, I'd have weakened them and, and anything that weakened them. So do you think that would have, because you're 
It wouldn't you have, have ended a friendship my friendship that lasts, yeah. don't you? It wouldn't have ended my time with them, but but it was. Um, Maybe I think it was an important test that that he didn't know that he was testing me, but it yeah. was. It ended up being an important test. And then the second one, which is actually, um, which is actually really lovely. Um, is that we won the? I signed the contracts to to do the to to, uh, to extend their contract for years, <clears throat> and also to acquire the best ofs, a box set, and also the best of the nineteen nineties and the best of the two thousand. Because we never had those those rights at our right. Records. It was a huge deal. I signed an eight hundred eighteen million dollar deal. Hundred eighteen million dollars. It was the biggest deal in the history of the music business at the time. But we lied and pretended that it was fifty million because that was less than Janet Jackson had received. So we weren't the biggest. So in everybody's heads, Janet Jackson was still the biggest, but we were by the country mile the biggest. Why did you want Janet Jackson to be the biggest? Because you you two did not want to be attached to money. They were not money people. What we didn't want, what we didn't want was for people to think that you two was all about money, which they they weren't about money, but anyway. So in that that deal, we got the right to do the best of um, the 1990s, the best of, and I had the right to put forward a track listing and, and Edge had the right to throw one back at me. And there was an adjudication. We were only out by one track where, you know, he, what I wanted, what he wanted was simpatico and it was good. But I needed a single and we didn't have a singles right. We had the best of soundtrack. So I went to, I flew to Dublin with a friend of mine, um, David Munns, who was the head of international for Universal. And I had a meeting with um, the band in um in the principal management's office. There's all four members of the band. And I said, we have that single. And they said, well, how can you? There's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. Everything's being released. It's a best of. Don't you understand that? And I said, <laughs> I said well, there is a B-side because I was their publisher. I knew the yes. songs. I said, there was a B-side in Australia called The Sweetest Thing. Oh. And they went. And that was you. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's interesting. So I put forward The Sweetest Thing as a, um, a potential track, but then Bono got really uh, angst, angsty, angsty, said, it'll never be a hit. It'll never make crack the top 10. It'll weaken us. It'll ne-. And I said, it will, you have to trust me. I've worked with you for so many years. I've never let you down. You've got to trust me. This is a hit song. And he said, all right, we'll have a bet. Now, I'm in front of the band and principal management and David Munns, who was very senior and Bono and I shook hands but we didn't specify what the bet was or what the um what the what the punishment was or whatever <laughs> and I bet that it would be a top 10 single and of course it went in at number three or number two in the charts and it was oh a huge hit. yeah it was yeah huge hit worldwide massive success we sold tens of millions of, of the best of uh, album and then Bono sent me a, a uh, a Peter Blake painted the guy who who did um, Sergeant Pepper. Oh wow! Uh, which I've got here in the house, um, and um, amongst uh, many other pieces of amazing stuff. Well, he 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 gave this to me as my reward for being wow. right. Wow! But that's telling truth to power. You know, you yeah. you can't just cave in. And it's so important. The truth is all we actually have in reality, isn't it? All your perception of the truth, at least. Yeah. But and then there are two. There are two truth to power things that have gone horribly wrong for me. Oh, let's let's so, talk about them. Um, and I'm not going to name names, but two really important artists for me as a manager. So I've left running Island Records and my relationship between a manager and an artist is contractual, but it's much more vicarious than a record deal. Yeah. A record deal is like serious, solid. Yeah. Um, a artist is, is termed personal service. Mm-hmm. So... No court can compel a manager to manage an artist, even though they've got a contract, or an artist to be managed by a, a oh, manager. Okay. Because it's just just not fair. So, yeah. so it's much more vicarious. And I have been fired twice from art managing international artists and on the same basis, same conversation. Really? Mark, you want my success more than I do. Twice. You you want my success more than I do. Wow. So that's pushing them to do things that, that are, they don't want to do. That, no, that, that they have to do in order to succeed. And in both cases, and I'm not going to name names, they failed since. Right. They failed, both of them. Because they didn't Huge do Huge names. It. Failed 
because they didn't accept the challenge of their own creativity. I was pushing them creatively to move into different directions and they haven't and they have failed. Off camera, I'm so intrigued to find out who they are. Oh, off camera, I'll delightful. delightful. <laughs> I'll, I'll never reveal to anyone, but I'm really interested in that. Yeah. So it just, it's about, it's about faith and trust, isn't it? And the relationship is everything. Yes. And what makes the difference between Bono and those other artists that go, no, you know, you want it more than I do and I don't want to go because there. Because Bono has always wanted it more than anyone else. Yeah. And he's always wanted it more than anyone else. We used to have a saying in Island Records that, um, because we, our, part of our job, our A&R department, our talent department, we used to buy records and send packages every month to Edge so that he could hear the new Oasis album. There's this yeah. new band called Oasis. You need to listen to this album. It's quite good. It's quite good. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so we'd send a package of, of the new shit that was coming out that we thought that they ought to be listening to because they always said to me, we want to be the younger brothers band. We don't want to be the older brothers band. Yeah. We don't want to be the dad's band. Of course they had the dad's band now. They have granddad's band yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. But back in the day, their ambition was such that they wanted to they wanted to attract the younger brothers, not not even not even the older brothers. But I think they're still so cool, even though they're granddads, but it doesn't actually matter. Yeah. They did manage to keep that they still are. Yes. The cool one of the coolest bands of all yeah. time. Um But I, I also I've got a special bond with Bono over it because in probably around about 1997, I got approached by a coalition of Christian charities, um, um, CAFOD and all sorts of different ones that um, came to me. I don't know why they chose me with this proposition called Drop the Debt. So Jubilee 2000. Yes. And they said to me that um, their problem was, was that the message was good but it was stuck in the pulpit and the pulpit was preaching to 15 people on a Sunday Yeah, and they were not getting the, the, the idea of international third world debt relief across. Could I help? I thought I'm from Mauritius, from the African diaspora. I've lived in the Yemen. I've spent time in Africa. I've spent, you know, Africa is, has been important to me in my life. Mm. Um, and so I thought, yeah, okay, I'll see what I can do. And I, I wrote to Bono, Brian Eno and um, two other executives in the music industry who I thought would get what I'm saying. And I said, I, I used, and it was handwritten letters. And it was kind of effectively saying, Dear Bono, in the year in which you contributed to Live Aid, Live Aid raised $118 million to, re to relieve the starvation of the, the poor of Ethiopia. What you didn't know is that Ethiopia as a government paid $120 million in interest payments on Kalashnikovs, helicopters, Mercedes that they had bought 40 years before. The bullets were all gone. The helicopters were burnt out in jungles. The cars were stolen by kleptomaniac um, um, you know, people. And, and yet they're still, they paid out more than they received. So we did all that work oh my God. for Live Aid. And yet the Ethiopian government paid out more in and and I explained why it it was redeemable. This was a redeemable situation. Two days went by, and Bono rang me at home, and he said, "Mark, I've been looking for something that would give meaning to the new to the new millennium." He said, "This is it. I'm going to make this my life's work." So that one handwritten letter did that. And he said, I'm going to make this my life's work. And he did. And I had to assemble. I took Bob Gelder off. I took everybody to Dublin to sit with them and talk about it. And we decided that Live Aid 2 was just another sticking plaster on an open yeah. wound. It needed an entirely different approach. Bono took two years of meeting with economists, really serious people, and Pettifor, the head of the World Bank, and all these incredibly, to understand that this could happen. It could be done. Because all the countries had written those debts off. They weren't expecting $120 million from Ethiopia. It just came in. Technically, they owed it, but the government had written it off. Oh it, was a, it was a bad debt in their heads. So Bono then spent, well, he's still spending his life um, doing this. And 
And then at the um, MTV Awards in 1999, he was awarded a, um, a, a humanitarian award and Mick Jagger presented it to him. And then Bono thanked the band for letting him go on this journey. And then he said, and um, I want to thank Mark Moreau for ruining my life. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and he said that at the MTV Awards, and I was just so choked. You know, I cried. You know, well, you, you can tell I would. cry easily. Yeah. I cried. I was just so choked. But if you read about it, if you read about what the campaign that he did, and there's a lot of people that don't like Bonnet because they think he pontificates. Yes, I know. His pontification has literally resulted in $100 billion oh of debt God. relief. That's a fact. So how can you argue that? You how can't. Can you, you in can't. history, in a hundred years' time, he might be more remembered for what he did for the poor of the world than he is for his songs. Which would be incredible, yeah, wouldn't it? And and it starts with a handwritten letter. And it Mark started Moreau. with a handwritten letter. Yeah, yeah. From that little boy that was six years old, shipped over to Leamington's bar, petrified, absolutely, of what the life was now going to become. Writes this letter later yeah. on in life. Yeah. And that leads to how much again, did you say? hundred billion dollars. hundred billion. Well, look it up. Drop the debt, red campaign, um, Jubilee 2000. There's been so many different iterations of it. America for, get, for, for giving their debt. You know, Gordon Brown in the UK, hundreds of millions of dollars. He From just your handwritten it. letter to Bono. Mark, when yeah. I said about being a legend at the beginning, you were like, no, no not I don't a legend like Because nobody knows that. That stuff is not legendary. It's just well, it factual. Is. Yeah. It is now. Okay. Right. It will be. It will be I'm out there. I'm a silverback mouse. You are a silverback mouse. And I, I guess there's a couple of questions before we tie things up that I'm really interested in. What do you mean tie things up? We've got a we've, week. We've, we? got, <laughs> we've, got, we've got forever. We're never <laughs> leaving. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask NWA, interesting band, uh, group. Yeah. And you obviously, tell me your involvement in bringing that. Okay, so uh, NWA were not signed by me or even my team. They yeah. were signed by Chris Blackwell, the founder of Island. Records. Yes. And so we, Island put out straight out of Compton, the first record, and it was controversial. It had fuck the police on it. Yeah. The Daily Mail got a writer to write a letter saying, this is disgusting. So when we were planning the release of the second album, which was my first responsibility, so we're talking 1990 here. Mm. So I've got the job running the record label, and it's the first record I'm going to be putting out. Your first record is Fuck the Police? No, it's um, Enfil for Zagin, the second Sorry. album. Okay. So, so I'm putting out the album, Enfil for Zagin. The Daily Mail get wind of it. They get an advanced copy from America. They reproduce the lyrics. They make fake, or that somebody writes letters and I get a call from the chairman of, of um, Polygram Records, who by this stage own Ireland. He's not my boss. Chris Blackwell is still my boss. But Maurice Oberstein rings me to say, I've had a call from the police. And if you don't cease and desist, they're going to um, arrest you and they're going to seize the album. And so it was like, OK. They were telling me that if I, if I would just simply take it off the release schedule and destroy those records that I've manufactured, it will all go away. So it was a it was a shot across my bow, and so I took a meeting with all my young braves. I told you I've oh, yeah. employed you know, Nick Angel, and I've got this fantastic team. I've got a young lawyer, um, Ian Moss. Um, we're all youngsters, and there's a couple of old heads. There's Tom Hayes, who's the chairman of the company, and Chris Blackwell, the owner, and I'm. And and so the police have warned us it's on the on the basis of obscenity. I my understanding of obscenity was obs to be obscene you have to be titillating. It's got to be about turning someone on. It's yeah. got to be about sexuality, sexual yeah. juices. It's got yeah. to be. It's not about things you disagree with. Yeah, that's not the same. An opinion. And opinions, you know. And there was nothing sexual about that record. There mm. was some very difficult opinions in it. But based on reality for them. But based on their reality yeah. from Compton and Watts yeah. in, in America. Which was a tough, tough stuff that they were allowed to be poetic about that in whatever totally. way they wanted to. Totally. And this was a brand new form of expression. It yeah. was giving people who had no um, agency o over their own uh, uh, stories yeah. um, a, 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 an articulation. Yeah. So to me, it felt really important. And I'd already... Worked with Public Enemy, and I'd worked with a bit with the Beastie Boys and De La Soul. So 
I'd had some experience in yeah. that area. And so we had the board meeting and then we thought, no, fuck the police. That's what yes. we thought. Fuck the police. We fucked the police. That's what we thought. And and you were risking getting arrested at so this point. So the police, so Morris Oberstein had to deliver back to the police. No, nope, they're pressing on. And so another message came back from the police saying, if we're going to prosecute under Section 2 of the Obscene Publications Act, which is the company, mm. and if we're successful, we're going to, char we're going to charge me uh, under Section 1 as being the controlling mind, the person who makes the ultimate decision. And so I am threatened. Luke, my son, is four months old. Oh, my life. My first child. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm new manager at Rolling Records and I'm facing a prison sentence if I get it wrong. So we took, we t this is such a great story. So we, we sought counsel's opinion. We, so we went to see a learned counsel in his chambers in London and he got all the papers. He listened to the music. And I remember I was, I went there with Andrew Sharland, who was our barrister and Ian Moss, who was my lawyer, knocked on the door and um, a, vo a lofty voice shouted, come <laughs> and i opened the door and he went yo motherfucker <laughs> i don't fancy your chances very much that and that's, is... that's before i've stepped in the door <laughs> that's brilliant so we went and heard his learned opinion and he said we had no chance we were we were in deep shit i came away and andrew charland and ian and i were all united it's, it's not obscene. And yeah. we're being charged under the obscene. You might as well have done it under the Terrorism Act. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, we then sought another council's <laughs> opinion. So we couldn't go around the world until we got somebody who told us we were right <laughs> and good looking. <laughs> um, and we found this fantastic guy called Jeffrey Robinson QC, who, was, who is now one of the leading freedom of speech advocates anywhere in the world. He's an Australian. And he had done very famous Oz trial, the fetus earring trial. He'd done some really difficult trials. Yeah. He was fucking brilliant. Firstly, calmed us down. It's going to be all right. You're not to worry about it. Don't worry about section one or section two. I'm going to solve this for you. And we went to Redbridge Magistrates Court. They see, they raided um, Polygram, seized all of the, we, we managed to ship 15,000 records. We manufactured about 45,000 albums to ship and we were shipping 45,000 and on the day of release, the police raided, but we'd already got 15,000 oh, out. thank God. <laughs> anyway, um, and they seized the rest um, and it went to court. So we went to Redbridge Magistrates Court and Jeffrey Robinson just demolished the Crown prosecution that, uh, people, demolished these amateur hour, half-baked, half-researched guys who'd had translations done of the lyrics. So... Yo, motherfucker, was hello, person who makes love to his mother <laughs> for, for the magistrate. So we had two, we had a, we had a guy, we had a magistrate <laughs> with, a, with a beret and a monocle and two ladies with blue rinses. No. And we are the <laughs> NWA and we've got fantastic people in, in defence. But the denouement, which he did not tell me, and he had a twinkle in his eye when we went in, Jeffrey Robinson, is that he'd had his clerk of the court go to a circle around Redbridge Magistrates' courts of all the commercial properties, and he had bought the hardest core pornography from this one over here, this one there, that one there, this one here. Took all the addresses down, and Jeffrey Robinson, we get to the, we get to the, we get to the, the peak of the performance, and he picks and he goes, now, ladies and gentlemen, this is obscene. <laughs> holds, holds up the centerfold of. Widows' wives, <laughs> and they were oh, the guy with the monocle was like, <laughs> yeah, zooming in. Picks up the gay one, gay <laughs> times. This is obscene because <laughs> he's just defined obscenity. Yeah, and then he gets to, he picks up the third one, and the the, uh, the chief magistrate says, "Stop, Mr. Robinson, <laughs> you've made your point. We're going to retire now." What was on the third page? Did those. you ever find out? I don't know. So um, so they retired and they came back two minutes later, two minutes later and found against the police. Police had to pay all the costs, had to return. No like, oh, it, was, it was a famous victory. Yes, I remember it well. And, yeah. and, and what you did then was you, you put a, an advisory on the, on the album. We put a parental advice, yeah. advisory on the album. But then we, it, 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 
this was how naive I was. Instead of putting the giant street posters that was NWA, you know, uh, by the album now, yeah. we did NWA as the headline, and then we had Article 7 of the, of the um, Human Rights Act about freedom of speech. Wow. So that was our poster, and we wow. put it all over the country. Wow. The right of people to say what they want. And then I wrote a big article in Box Magazine basically saying... We all have the right to be offended, but we can't stop people set, give, giving us different opinions to the yeah. one that we hold. And, and actually, that is, and this may not be what people want to hear, but that is what's wrong with the world now, is everyone is cancelled. Absolutely. Yeah. Everyone yeah. is cancelled. No one, you don't have to agree with someone to hear exactly. them. Absolutely. And that's what is going wrong now. And yeah. this is what I really loved about, you know, seeing snippets of your story is that, you were the person that was fighting for people, whether you like them or not, whether you agree with them or not. And there were some really difficult lyrics on that yeah, album. I know. And I had to defend them. Yeah. And then the, the, there's a denouement to that too, which was the Ice Cube was the next record that I, that I was that I, I was love Ice out. Cube. And I love Ice Cube, but there was an anti-Semitic track. Right. No, it wasn't anti-Semitic. It was attacking Korean shopkeepers. Right. It was a little story from Compton and Watts that, that was making it onto a big album. So yeah. Straight, was it, no, well, I can't remember what the album was called got the gold disc here. Um, <laughs> as um, you do. Yeah, as you do. Um, and I had to persuade him to take the track off the album. And then another difficult conversation. Uh, yeah, so I had to go to America, sit in front of Ice Cube and say, this is going to cause you all sorts of problems. And the, there's, I said, there's two solutions. You decide to take it off the album. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Or you take the album back and find someone else to release it as it is. And you said that to him. Mm -hmm. And he took it off the album. Wow. And get and let me release it. The same I did the same with um Morrissey. There was a there was a there was a track Just Morrissey. Yeah, there was a track he was gonna release that was gonna get in in so much trouble and I flew to LA again, sat with him at the Chateau Marmont Hotel, and we didn't get on very well. He thought I was a posh boy. He uh, thought you were yeah, a posh yeah, boy. Yeah, yeah. I thought I did okay. But I, I did the same thing. Either take the track uh, I, I either you take the track off the album. Not me. Yeah. You make that choice. Yeah. Or you can have the album back and you can release it yourself. And he took the track off the Did album. Did he ever like you after that? No. No, he never got on. Really? Just some Just people. Some, some people, people don't. Do, but I can't imagine don't. no one get anyone that wouldn't get on with you. And the Smiths. <laughs> maybe maybe you could smell. Maybe you could feel. I never <laughs> ever liked the Smiths ever in my career. Ever one song. Not ever. And. Maybe he can feel it from me. Something he saw in my it in, in, the, yeah. in the auras. Yeah. He's a, he's a, I just inherited See, I didn't sign him. Right. When I merged MCA Universal and Ireland, he was an um, MCA artist. Right. And so I inherited him. I inherited some lovely people that I worked with, like, um, um, what's, his, what's the face? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, what's his name? Yeah, Paul Weller. Paul Weller. <laughs> so I inherited some brilliant people. Um, but then I inherited people that I didn't have the same respect for, and that was very difficult. Yeah. So I went to sleep one Friday worrying about PJ Harvey's career, and on the Monday morning, I kid you not, <laughs> I'm having a conversation about what should follow up Barbie Girl <laughs> for Aqua. <laughs> Thinking, what the PJ fuck? Harvey. What the fuck has happened to my life? <laughs> I'm having to think about Barbie Girl, you know. <laughs> The oh. kids now, they would say, fuck my life. Oh, no, I know. <laughs> I know there, was a, there was another, uh, uh, there was an artist, that, that I, I'm not going to say who they are, who I really did not like. Their Again, music. off the record. Off the record. I, and I think, no, no, I, you can have, this is on the record because I'm not going to say who they are. Yeah, but I will find out off the record. Okay, I mean. yeah, okay. So <laughs> I inherited them and I didn't respect them. I didn't like what they did. Um, never showed that. No. Um, and had to go to their studio out of London and I was in the studio and I kept getting this kind of strange light in my eyes. And it was weird. And then I looked and the bass player had a handgun with a laser on it. And the fucking laser <laughs> was going around my forehead. Oh, <laughs> this is absolutely true. The laser was kind of going. <laughs> I'm thinking, what life have I got? What, what, what am I doing here? And <laughs> Barbie girl. And a gun, <laughs> all in about five sentences. <laughs> wow. Thinking, thinking, yeah, this is an interesting life I'm having. I mean, again, these stories. But then it's amazing people I've met. You know, I, 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 I did a great thing. For, I did something good for Chris Blackwell. And, he's, and he, um, he said, what do you want? He said, I want you to stay. I used to go into New York on a 
Sunday. Oh, I left my eye on, on the red eye on Friday night. And he um, he said, stay the weekend. What would you like to do? And I said, I'd really like to um, see some art. I've never spent quality time in New York. And he said, oh, leave it with me. And he said, um, meet me at a certain restaurant. And I met him in Soho in in New York. And we had lunch. Him, his 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 wife, eventually uh, Chip, and Andy Warhol and Jean-Michel Basquiat. And that was my lunch, and I was terrified and absolutely aware of what an amazing thing. And then one time... Did you actually manage to get any words out? Or did you hardly, just like... no, no, hardly, I didn't need to. And also they were having a terrible row. I, I won't go into it, but... They were having a terrible row? Basquiat and Warhol were fucking rowing like girls. It was just unbelievable. Oh my God. But that's another story. Um, <laughs> and then um, um, when I was managing Cat Stevens, Yusuf Islam, he was invited to perform at the Nobel Peace Prize. And so I flew in with him. I organized the whole thing, flew in to do the performance. And then I had this dinner with the recipient of the, of the Nobel Peace Prize, who's an amazing man, um, Mohammed Yunus, um, who invented the Grahman Bank. And the Grahman Bank is it does microloans to the poorest people. Oh. Only women won't loan, loan to men. They'll loan enough money to buy a sewing machine, cloth, um, um, but cotton, so that so that women can it's, wow. can self empower themselves. It's an absolute. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for it. So anyway, Yusuf and I go there, and after um, Mohammed Yunus is so enamoured with Yusuf Islam that we go for lunch and we're joined by Desmond Tutu. So <laughs> I've got Cat Stevens, <laughs> Desmond Tutu, and the, no, the Nobel I'm Peace sure, Laureate. I'm sure that you've and dreamt Desmond a lot of this. Tutu, <laughs> has ordered fat chips with his meal and I've got skinny chips with my burger <laughs> and he keeps nicking the fucking chips off my plate. <laughs> and every time he nicked one, he'd, he'd high five me. Cause I'm in the music business. So I'm a high five man. And that's, uh, that's the most random story I mean, I know, I've ever I've heard got, in my I've life. I've just got a million of them. I, 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 was, in the, I was in a hot tub in, uh, in the Bellage Hotel in, in LA and it was like two o'clock in the morning I'd got back from somewhere. And somebody slipped in beside me, and it was Robert Palmer. <laughs> Just, <laughs> Robert in Palmer. the hot tub. And I was, I was his, I was his record, and he didn't know I was his record. So me. You didn't even know. No, no, he I did. Didn't, he, he didn't, didn't know, know I was the boss of Island Records. He just happened to be. Did you tell him? Of course, I did. And then my son Luke and I are in the vi in, in his video for every kind of people. Luke, Luke was only four months old, and I'm holding him as oh, a baby, wow. and we're in the every kind of video, every kind of people video. Do you remember everything that's happened? Like, there must be stories you can't remember. Yeah, and there are some that I can't tell. I'm off yes. the record. I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah, I want to hear them I'll tell you all. later. This is... I remember, I remember everything. It was, it was so just blessed, you know. And that's probably because you didn't take a, all the drugs. Because I didn't take the drugs. I was, I was present you were in present. the room. That's such a really important point, actually. I'm not trying to, you know... Make anyone feel better. Just say no. <laughs> Just say no, the Grain Chill song. I remember that well. Um, but to be present in, in your own life is actually quite difficult to be for most yeah. people. They, they're they either 10 steps ahead or still living in the past. Yeah. Do you feel like you were always as No, I think as... the last few years, I think as, the, as my marriage began to break down, I was not present. I wasn't present in the marriage. And... I lived in, the, my, my family had owned a home in the village that I was living in for 50 years. I left last year after 50 years. So it was literally just by coincidence, I left the village for 50 years. But I feel like I hadn't been present in my community even for, for five years, probably since I started my journey as an artist. Yes. Partly because the work was very dark. It was actually very emotional. I'm sure, yeah. Send me to a weird place, but yeah. you know, Something was happening in my head, and I, I'm not. I'm, I'm kind of here to try and recover from it and whatever. What was it? Escapism? Because if you were escaping, you were escaping to a really dark place. For a I was. Of time. I was escaping from a place of comfort, yeah. which was the music business, where I was successful and I was recognised and I was respected, and I was going into a place that I had never been before. And it was the subject matter was dark. Yeah. You know, I was going to a dark place. You can't. You, you couldn't do what I did without without um, absorbing a lot of the darkness in it. See, that's what I'm really interested in, the choice, because you knew what the subject was. It wasn't like you 
stumbled across it. Oh, I'm here in the dark. It was a choice. Yeah, yeah. I knew exactly what I was getting into. But it goes back to the mouse. I didn't, I didn't know what it was going to do to my head. I, I knew what the subject matter was about and I knew it was dark, but I didn't know that it might take me to a dark place. Could I ask this question then, because this is really interesting to me. Have you seen the, um, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but it's because it really stayed with me. And I think we all do this to ourselves sometimes, that form of self-harm, where you know you've got to do it to continue to be the best version of yourself. And there's a <clears throat> Netflix documentary with uh, Sylvester Stallone, and he talks about the struggle and his relationship with his father to become the, the actor that he was. And then once he'd had success with Rocky, he kind of lost that um, drive, I guess, because he was no longer struggling. Yes. And so the question is, did you feel that you need... Because you'd had all that excitement in the Yemen. And then from there, life had thrown you lots of different curveballs that were big, massive mm -hmm. curveballs. And then the, the life that you lived with all these experiences was so big. Did you feel that it had got a bit, a bit beige? I felt like I was a, a mouse. Yeah. A mouse on a circular wheel. Yes. And what became very difficult and what really actually it's going to be sound so bizarre because she's not my heartland musically. My heartland is very alternative. But what really upset me was being very close to the Jesse J project. Yeah. Where um, a great team of people put a, an album together around her, songwriters, producers, fantastic manager in Mark Hargreaves, um, who, who was my partner. Um, and the, 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 some, a friend of mine in the music industry made a joke, which is when the envelope comes from the record company that's got the big check in, People open it up and they take the check out and they think there's brains in the envelope as well. Yeah, yeah. Just because you've made a ton of money and you've written some hit songs doesn't mean that you are the story. Yeah. You're the tip of the iceberg and there is this huge iceberg underneath the waterline. Mm. And of course, she got rid of everybody. And that was the end of, end of her com commercial career. It's what happens all the time. I got so sick of that, seeing that happen. Yeah. So see, seeing things become, I mean, there's a chapter in my book about the cranberries where literally greed destroyed the cranberries. And really? it's, it's not to be gone into here. But the cranberries were destroyed by greed. Mm. By greed. Mm. Nothing and, you know, where everybody that made the cranberries happen, work, everybody got fired except me and the publisher because we had the contracts that couldn't be fired. Right. We were watertight. Yeah. But they fired the, ma the brilliant managers. So uh, Jeff and Jeanette from Rough Trade, who went on to, who managed Pulp for me. So I was really trusted. Yeah. Uh, they went on to manage Duffy. They're, they're huge managers. They're really, yeah. really, they got fired. The accountant got fired. Ozzy Kenny, U2's account, fired. Um, John Kennedy, the f most formidable lawyer in, in the in the entertainment industry, fired anybody. That, uh, Stephen Street, their producer that made the first two records that sold 21 million copies, fired everybody that could be fired, got fired. Why do they do that? Because, well, I've got to be really careful. A relationship happened and... The person in the relationship wanted to impose all of his okay, own. Okay, got you. So the team was replaced, effectively, with ineffectual, useless people that couldn't even recognise a an alternative record if it if it fell off the wall and hit them on the head. Is that often the case with? Totally, all all the time. And and so to answer your question, I got sick of it over and over again. Yeah. You know, but by the time Jesse J fired us been doing it for 35 nearly 40 years by that stage and this they was think, after great success that she fired huge everyone. success price tag all of those big hits yeah and um i'm just thinking to myself this is bored i'm bored with it i'm not disappointed i'm not shocked i'm just bored with this fucking yeah. hamster wheel yeah going round and, yeah. round and round and then art came along as as a, a, what seemed like a great ex escape but Ironically, I'm coming back into music because 
uh, art, I'm still doing art, and I'm really, yeah. really looking forward to releasing the work with Carly yes. that I'm doing at the moment. Me which too. Is, which is going to be beautiful. Yeah, it's going I am, to be. I, I know it is. But I'm, I'm, I want to do... One of the reasons for coming to Spain, too, is that I've unbundled my life. I don't have any costs. I've got no mortgage, no car payments, no this, no that. Not council tax. I pay 40 euros per year, guys. Yeah. 40 euros <laughs> a year. I have a very, very different life economically now. I've had a mortgage since I was 24 years old. Yeah. Oh, God, everything's yeah. gone. All costs are gone. So I can begin to do what I want to do rather than what I have to do. Yeah. In order to put three children through public school, my choice. Yeah. My choice. Yeah. A really expensive mortgage, uh, the nice cut, the Porsches, the yeah. convertible Audis, you know, all of that stuff that I've done over the years, all gone, unbundled. My car, guys, is a Dacia Duster that has 145,000 miles on the clock. I am not the same person that I used to be, you know, um, because I want to do what I want to do, not what, because what what I have to do. And it's, it, I, I think I'm only just beginning to realize the importance and the power of that for me. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be very powerful for me. And so I'm doing a mixture of things. I am going to be managing bands. Mm. I am making a comeback record with a band that I absolutely love and have loved with, loved for years. Mm -hmm. um, it's nothing to do with you 2 or any of, the, any of the names that you've heard so far. Um, and I um, have found a new talent that I'm really excited about, a 20-year-old um, girl who's really, really exciting. Um, and also I'm involved in a couple of startups. So I'm... I'm doing a whole portfolio of things. That you really and if want to. And one of them comes off, that's fantastic. If none of them come off, it's not a disaster. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm a man committed to over-delivering, so I will work hard for all of them, mm. you know. But you'll yeah. love it because it's what you want. And I'll love it because I want to do it, not because I have to do it. So <clears throat> I guess there's one more question, which I think will sort of um, hopefully overlap everything else, which is, do you have, because um, we talked about intuition and instinct, do you have an idea of where that comes from for you in terms of um, what you believe to be true about, you know, the, the how we're all here and what, what really drives us in terms of our moral compass and, and our belief systems? Or is that question too big to answer? <laughs> yes and no. Yeah. It's too big to answer and no, I don't have <laughs> no. um, <laughs> I probably do if you'd have prepared me for the question. <laughs> I like because, to just leave one in there. Because it's a terrific question. Um, no. And, and also, it's, I don't... I know what interests me. Mm. And it's so... It's going to sound so selfish, is that I'm not thinking of you guys in the audience when I sign Pulp or, or Elbow you yeah. know, or PJ. Yeah. I'm thinking about what turns me on and I have a really interesting lesson from the beginning of my career right at the beginning of my career um around about 1983 there was a band called the Roaring Boys mm -hmm. and they were um a group of four, four or five beautiful Cambridge graduates mm -hmm. really gorgeous who had contacts in the media and they were on the front cover of the Sunday Times color supplement culture section mm. without a record deal or a publisher wow. or a manager Wow. And I made contact with them and they decided they want to sign to me. Um, and I'm running Blue Mountain Music. My budget is £50,000 a year. That's what I've got to spend in, in uh, 1982. Their deal, because everybody was after them, was £200,000. So four years budget. So I fly to New York and I say to Chris, I've won the deal. They want to sign to me. I'm only 24 years old. They're all about 22 years old. They want to sign to me. It's the biggest. Look at the front cover. Here's the evidence, the color supplement thing. And Chris said, um, well, I'll back you if you want to do this. He said, this is, you know, it's a career. It's a career. It's either going to make or break your career. In yeah. one, your first sign. This was my first signing. He said, you, you've got to tell me you love it. And I said, well, well I wouldn't listen to it at home. <laughs> so, and he went, fuck. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? And I said, well... This is this Duran Duran. This is what everybody's listening to. And, and he said, but you you don't love it? I said, well, it's not my thing. I'm, you know. And he said, what are you playing at? 
He said, get on the plane, fly back to England and really think about it because this could end your career. It could make your career. It could end your career. I went back and I had to ring them and say, I'm not going ahead <coughs> with the deal. They were furious, but they got another deal. They signed to Virgin Music and they failed completely ah. from the first record they released because because they'd been on the front cover of the, and they were pretty boys and they were from Cambridge and they had contacts in the media. The media just went ah, off to them. Wow. And they failed. They didn't even scrape the charts. They made, and it would have ended my career in one go, one go. And I went away and I followed Chris Blackwell's advice, which was sign what you love. Because if you love it, you will put more effort behind it. You'll put more thought behind it. And so the next deal I did, so this was a £200,000 deal that I passed on. And then I paid £15,000 and I got pump up the volume. Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> and did you love that song? I loved it. It's I brilliant. didn't sign that song. I signed a band called Colorbox. Yeah. <laughs> they were merged with a band called ARK and they became Mars. And that song became just ginormous. Yes. And it was number one in 16 countries. And then the beautiful thing is that I signed it to Island Records in America. Um, so it was on the record label in America. I was the music publisher, remember? I was, yes, you know, yes. Okay. So I signed it to the record label in America and it was the first number one in the history of Island Records in America. And it put me right on the map where everyone was going, where did that come from? Him. So it was a beautiful moment. And that was as in the direct result of Chris Blackwell saying, sign what you love, don't sign. So everything that I did, Sometimes you get coerced into signing things where you're not convinced, but you love the person that's brought it to yes. you. Yes. And you need to trust them because you're paying them. Yes. And they need to be given their head. So sometimes you make, uh, you, and, and, you know, but the things, that, the things that I'm proud of and the names that you know, there's not one of them that I didn't love. So really that's the biggest, to answer that question is to move with love rather than you know, just the, the money. It was certainly not yeah. the money because that was never your, you were never driven by the never money. Never driven by the money, no. Never, and, and I nearly was by that first deal with the Roaring Boys. Yes. And I, I learned a salutary lesson. I learned it the, I learned it the, well, I about to say the hard way. I didn't, I learned it the easy way. It could have been because the hard Because I was, way. I was um, headed off at the pass by a, uh, by a caring boss. So where does that, um, for you, where does that energy, where do you feel it when you, when you know, like where's the... It's just, it's, absolutely in your chest it's yeah it's it, intrinsic you know yeah and when you don't get the deal when you know it and you're chasing the deal yeah. and somebody else gets it oh my god it's devastating <laughs> because it's a, it's a fucking love affair you're yeah. in love with that person but that yeah. person isn't reciprocating yes so you're heartbroken so you're rejected and i don't do rejection well this start, goes back to what you were saying about the school yeah yeah going to the school at age six that sense of i've been rejected yeah yeah. And that, that must hurt every single time it's happened. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, there's probably a thousand more stories in you. There's two more I'm going to tell. Please do. Just, just so that your audience don't think that I think I'm brilliant. <laughs> I, I, I passed on Radiohead. They were called... I think you told me this. They were, called, they were called on a Friday. I didn't really like them. We had so much success going on with other shit that I said no. No. And my staff were angry with me, and oh my God, were they right? Wow! <laughs> and I passed on Daft Punk. That was the other one. Wow! Too I thought massive. I thought all around the uh, was it all around the world? Yeah. yeah. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. I really loved it, but the deal was so big. I thought it's only a one-off dance track. It's it's you know, so I passed. Those are two, and there are others, but those two. I just I'm owning up to the audience that I'm not. How do you infallible. feel about that on the reflection? I'm quite proud of it. I'm quite. Yeah. I'm all right with that. Yeah. I remember having lunch with Chris Blackwell and um, Peter Grant, who managed Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Once, where Peter Grant said, to, told me a story. I thought I knew everything about Island Records. I thought I was the island historian, and I knew that uh, what I didn't know was that Chris had heard the Led Zeppelin um, demos first and had agreed to sign them with Peter Grant. And Peter Grant told me the story in front of Chris. So Led Zeppelin were going to sign to Island Records, but Chris couldn't afford the deal. We were too little. So he sent the Led Zeppelin demos to Ahmet Ertegen at Atlantic Records in America and said, will you partner me? You take America, I'll take the rest of the world. Ahmet Ertegen heard the demos of Led Zeppelin, got on a plane, flew to the UK, 
and stole them from us. No. Signed them on a worldwide basis. And I said, and I know that Armit remained Chris's best friend. And I said, Chris, how do you feel about that? Island Records could have had Led Zeppelin for the World X USA. How do you feel about that? And he said, it's very simple, Mark. He said, if we'd have had Led Zeppelin, we wouldn't have needed Bob Marley. Wow. Isn't that a great answer? Yes. Isn't that a lovely answer? And that's such a good metaphor for everything, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Like so One door closes, another opens. Indeed. And it is always the case, isn't it? When you look back, you realise that actually the, the thing that you lose is, is it becomes, if, if you've got this mindset, inconsequential because you've got this thing here, yeah. which you wouldn't have had. Yeah. That's amazing. And what I don't want to do is end this interview with anything that is really important for you to say, because I think the stories that, I mean, this has just been jaw drop after jaw drop after jaw drop. And I feel with you, there's probably some more and I don't want to like stop filming because I think so much more could come out. But is there anything else that you think fundamentally, especially in terms of you've been to that little dark space? Um, I've been to it twice. Mm. Um, halfway through Island Records, in particular when I was having to make the merger happen, the mer where I was having to break up the thing that I loved effectively yeah. and, and remodel it, I, I went into a suicidal depression. Right. Suicidal ideation. I, mm. I did not want to be here anymore. Mm. I felt that I had lost my relationship with Chris Blackwell, who I loved. Yes. And... I um, felt that I could never be that person that managed upwards. I wasn't interested in the big wigs that ran Universal. It was just a coincidence that they they had they had made a career decision on my behalf in buying my company. Right. And they were making a career decision on my behalf by asking me to merge these companies together, and it it literally undermined me. And I joke about Barbie Girl and Aqua. But those were really stressful things because yeah. I had never chosen to do that. Somebody else made that decision yeah. for me to have to deal with that kind of shite. Yeah. Just not, you know, <laughs> I had, and more than that, no, oh, it's, it's, it's complicated, but it, it put me into a spin that made me not want to be here anymore. And I knew that I was a gentle person, but I also knew that if I opened up to anyone within the music industry, it would kill me dead finish my career because there was no gentleness or um, grace in the music industry. It's yeah. fucking merciless. Yeah. Tough play. There's a Hunter, a Hunter S. Thompson quote about it being a, a shallow money trench lined by pimps and hookers. And then again, it's got its downsides. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant, isn't it? That's great. I love that quote. Um, and it, that's what it is. And mm. so I had to heal myself and I had to seek my own um, help. And I did. And then again, when I went into the art side, which is what took me into a dark place, I went into a proper, proper suicidal depression again. So it's mm. twice. And I know my mother always had a bit of a bipolar thing mm. going on, mm. I think. Um, and I have just the edges of it that mm. can take me into a dark place for a few months. But I've also got the self-awareness to know that if I don't shake myself up and shake myself out of it, then then I'll um, I, I could go really dark. Mm. Um, but I know I know enough to to know what to do. What keeps you going then when you're in that place? Um, friendships, mm. friendships. Mm. So um, taking going outside the music industry, outside the, the sphere um, of influence, as it were. Um, but also um, the first time round. Um, I did seek help and I, we used to have a service. So if one of our artists came in from America and they had a sore throat and they were going on later for mm. argument's sake, we couldn't send them to a local GP because they were not registered. So we'd go to Harley street. We had a, we had a company doctor. And so I'd go and see, I went to see the company doctor and, and I, because I knew it was private. It was just between yeah. him and me. It was not, not going on anybody's records. And I told him what was going on. And he, in fact, um, uh, he prescribed uh, probably one of the first ever dosages in the country of Prozac. Yeah. So I went on to Prozac for one month. I fucking hated it. Yeah. It just put me into a dead numb, numb zone. 
just it was just the that was like something from a not great for a creative. It was something exactly, and it was something like f f you know f from Black Mirror. I was yeah. In a, I was in a null space. Yeah. And um and so I took myself off it. But here's the thing: is that the very act of seeking help helped me. Yes, it is that it's making that it's choice. It's almost like a placebo. Effect. It is a placebo. I made a choice yeah. that I did not want to be that person. And I, and I recovered. And then also, I suppose, when you've got that, that duality of experience, does it make the stuff that you're doing now so much more vibrant because you've been there? Yeah, yeah. So, you so appreciate when it. I went into the dark space in art, I understand the dark space because I've been through the dark space. Yeah. I'm not an outside observer. Mm. The, anything that you anybody sees in their art that says it made me cry yeah. is because it makes me cry. Yeah, I have not done my job if I create the art and don't feel the emotion that I want the yeah. audience to feel. How can I? Yeah. So for you, um, I'm just thinking about that 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 Yemen experience again because it, it stays with me that although it was very exciting, there's a lot of darkness within that, you know, the bombs and the, the dead yeah. bodies being flung over the playground wall or whatever, you know. Do you think that there's a little part of you that needs to be there uh, to, from time to time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I definitely do. Yeah. I definitely do. But to go back to the beginning of the conversation, especially about the Yemen, I, I, I am that six year, I, I know I am. I like to say to everybody that I have a God complex mm. and that, that my role in the world is to fix everybody. Mm. It's not. My role is to be needed. I need to be needed. Mm. And it's a terrible burden mm. because I'm not always needed mm. like my marriage. Yeah, which is obviously quite a big pain. For, it it's, keeps you in that loop of why. Yes. Why am I not enough to be yeah. needed yeah. or to, to be enough? To, to be loved or to be enough to be successful. Everyone's got a different label to that. Yeah. Why do you feel that it's so important to be needed? I don't know. It's, 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 um, it's that, it was that, you know, it's all, I, I, I you have to tell me, <laughs> you're, you're the boss in this conversation. I think what, you know, I think it's because I was just dumped in this, bleak place mm. at such a young age that um that in a way in order to be able to navigate myself in it in the hierarchy and the hierarchy was often loud personalities sportsmen rugby players big fellas and i wasn't that person i was big thank fuck i was yeah, tall yeah but i was art, art and music i was the gentle guy mm. you know and um, and I think that I carved myself a role of being needed and then realised that it was self-rewarding. <laughs> well, it was survival. It was survival, exactly. Yeah. It was a survival mechanism. And I think also um, it, it was a way of being validated. If yeah. you could be, if you could carve that space and work out a way to be pivotal in, in that space. Yeah. And I would say as well that if you went at that age, because it is so important in terms of development before we're seven, if you're put into a place where you don't recognise, which doesn't feel very welcoming and doesn't feel very warm, the core will be, it's not necessarily about being needed, it's about not being enough. Yeah. And then from there, you, you build a way. Yeah, I would, I would recognise that. Yeah. And yet, it, it's probably been the most important thing that ever happened to you, because I know that we spoke about the, you know, being so poorly and everything else, but I think that drive to be enough yes. has been yeah. what's the, the passion, the love, the love story, yeah, which is really important. But on a final question, I keep saying this, and I don't want to miss anything from your story because if we start talking later and I hear some more stories, I'm right, get the cameras back <laughs> on. Um, but who's been the biggest inspiration for you? Actually, it, it, it is Chris Blackwell. Mm. Um, again, um, he's a legend that people don't know. Yeah. But he is a legend. So are you, though. That's why I said it. But he's a legend because <laughs> he kind of invented the modern music industry. He invented yeah. the independent label. Um, and other people followed in his, in, in his wake. Mm. And he, um, he spotted me and he just gave me every blessing. And then we fell, we fell out terribly at the end, which is really sad. 
but we have had a bit of a rapprochement, which I'm happy about. So that's that that that's not stayed as a fallout. Then you've been able. To... Yeah, we 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 met uh, in the last two years, and it's been good. We had lunch, and it was it was lovely. It was great. Yeah. It's good to see him. But yeah, it w- it would never be the same. But he at you know, I, my father was the was the funny colonel, but not a creative bone in his body. And um, Chris Blackwell was my dad. He yeah. became my creative dad, and he gave me every blessing that you could possibly imagine, and then some. Mm. encouraged me to do things that could fuck up and mm. take risks and mm. um, allowed me to do things that were completely outside my scope, you know, um, TV series and a, and, a, and a wildlife film. <laughs> you know, I was 26 years old and he said, yeah, fine, that's great, sounds good, let's do it. Let's have lunch with Alan Yentov. <laughs> You know, and um, and he just um, he gave me all the blessings, so he's my inspiration. He took the lid off, took and then the lid off you to all. just go where you wanted. Absolutely, and um, just happened to hit a a, zeit, a moment in my zeitgeist where I I was fearless, and so he 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 let the he let the mouse go. Yeah, the silverback <laughs> mouse. The, the silverback silver mouse. mouse was gone. <laughs> I mean, this has just been from beginning to end. The most engaging, wonderful Well, I've really stories. enjoyed talking to you about it. If you don't get a Netflix documentary about yeah, your life, I will be shocked. It's up to you now. <laughs> yeah, you I'm taking me. this yeah. because the, you, you're phenomenal. Well, I'm just me. I know, but that's the beauty of it. That's I'm what makes me. you so phenomenal. And anyone that gets to sit with you and talk to you for this length of time about your life is blessed. I'm very blessed to be able to do this. And I love the fact that you are so humble as well. And yet names and experiences just pour out of you. And it's like a fountain of everything that's exciting and good in the world. And I mean that. It's been such a, a pure joy to be here oh, and listen. It's the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> I'm, I'm, um, I just have this helicopter overview and I still ask, I'm going to, I'm not going to be any the wiser having done this interview. I want to be. Yeah. I'm not going to be because I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand how it happened to me. But it did. I can't take it away. I can't deny it. It's you. You don't. The, the great thing is, is that you you're not looking at your own reflection. You're looking at everybody else. Yeah. Which is, but that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Because you're not looking in the mirror going, look at me, look at everything. You're just looking at everybody else and going, wow. Yeah. You forget that you're a wow. I can see that, and that's why I started off with the the word legend. You forget that you are the wow in the story as well. All right, thank you. But you're very you're very welcome. Thank you very much for doing this today. It's been a total pleasure. Yeah, it has, and and I and I um thank you for letting me stay here as well because it's beautiful. Yeah, my, it's my pleasure. <laughs> that's a wrap, everybody.